का तैयारी कर रहा है सर ओके हाय फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू अवर इंडियन आर्थ्रोस्कोपी सोसाइटी वेबिनार दिस इज अ वेरी स्पेशल वेबिनार टुडे मॉडरेटेड बाय डॉक्टर दिनशा पाडीवाला द वेबिनार फॉर्मेट इज एसेंशियली अ केस प्रेजेंटेशन सेशन अलोंग विद अ पोल क्वेश्चन सो दिनशा इज गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट सर्टेन केसेस ऑन कार्टिलेज लीजंस एंड वुड आस्क फॉर पोल क्वेश्चंस टू बी लॉन्च्ड टू द फैकल्टी and faculty will give answers about the poll and then the discussion would ensue after that so this is something very much different and it's on a format which is based on an international format let us make it a success uh, please uh, uh, join us uh, in this webinar uh, let me hand over it to dinsha to start uh, the proceedings dinsha okay great uh, thank you very much ips thank you very much uh, indian arthroscopy society so we've got uh, i think a lot of interesting webinars going on these days and uh, this one's going to be a case based webinar on cartilage repair so what i'm going to do is present a few cases uh, we'll have some polls anyone on zoom can uh, also poll and then we've got our four very senior faculty members uh, dr abhay narvekar we've got uh, dr vinod santosh and deepak goelia and they will then give their opinions i think we always remember in uh, any sorry uh, in any case based thing remember for cartilage repair uh, there are many options which are available and um, it it really depends on uh, surgeon to surgeon there are some surgeons who will prefer certain techniques so there's no true real you know this is the correct answer that's the correct answer i think always under the circumstances and what facilities the surgeon has his decisions will be based on that and so for us we've chosen a faculty list which uh, come from different parts of the country who will have uh, different sorts of facilities and techniques available to them so it'll be interesting to hear what we can do for these uh, different cases so we'll start off first uh, i would request uh, 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 whoever needs to keep his mic on keeps the mic on but otherwise we'll mute the rest of the mics okay so we'll start with the first case and the first case is a 16 year old boy he's uh, sustained a twisting injury to his knee while he's skating he's presented two days after his injury with a painful swollen knee he's got no ligament tears on evaluation his patellofemoral joint is stable and that x-ray out there shows us that fragment of bone that we are seeing out here we got an mri done and in that mri again we can see that he's got an osteochondral fracture lying out there in the intercondylar area his ligaments and menisci are normal he's 16 years old we try to find out where that's from that's from the lateral femoral condyle so you can see that's the lateral femoral condyle there that it's off from it's an acute lesion it's just 2 days old he's got the bone edema there a few more mri cuts again we can see that that's the piece there that's the lateral femoral condyle where it's come out from so the poll question number 1 what would you do for this patient he's 16 years old he has an acute osteochondral fracture would you do an open osteochondral fracture fixation would you do an arthroscopic osteochondral fracture fixation would you do an arthroscopic loose fragment removal with a bone marrow stimulation or would you remove the fragment and do a mosaic plasty or would you do a loose fragment removal with an autologous chondrocyte implantation so five options sandeep can we get the poll up thank you So let's see. Okay. Yes, Sandeep, what's the result for that? Okay, so sixty-three percent would like to do an open fracture fixation. Twenty-five uh, percent would do it arthroscopic, and we do have a few who would also remove the fragment and do a a, a mosaic plasty. Uh, Dr. Narvekar, can you tell us what your choice was and how you chose that option? Uh, 
Dr. Narvika to unmute, please. Switch. Uh, so uh, this fragment uh, seems to be a fairly large fragment. It seems to be having come out from the posterior lateral portion of the lateral femoral condyle. I think my approach towards uh, an arthroscopic fixation is going to be very difficult because uh, getting the perpendicularity for this particular thing would be very, fairly difficult. And therefore, I would uh, go in for an open fixation. I probably would uh, also get a CT scan done because I don't know exactly where that fragment has come from. And maybe I feel that I might have to take a posterior lateral approach and fix it. Okay. Uh, was there anyone in the faculty who said arthroscopic? So if someone's done arthroscopic, can they just tell us some tips on how they would manage this arthroscopically? Deepak? Uh, no, I chose the open fixation open. for this. Okay. Yeah. Vinod? Yeah, I choose open. But the okay. uh, only thing I want to add here is Yes. Uh, that uh, I will be ready with some uh, my instruments for uh, mosaic plasty or, or also that's not to replace all, but I'll fix it. But sometimes some part of the uh, fragment may not be really uh, having sufficient bone underneath. So Correct. sometime I may have to use fixation with one plug as a hybrid sort of thing. So that should always that is always in my armamentarium once I proceed for this. Okay. And I'll go for open. Okay. Uh, Santosh, what did you choose? I would go along with the others where we do an open fixation. Uh, okay. Only, only uh, additional point is uh, a medial parapetal are open. Uh, got to freshen the base. The base looks to be filled up with bone, even though this is an acute uh, stage four. Maybe the yeah. loose body was acute, but the lesion must have been going on for some time. The base has been filled up to some extent. So you might need to freshen the base so that the fragment sits in okay. properly. Now, all, all of the faculty members seem to have taken a pre-operative decision that they're going to fix it. So, uh, Dr. Narvikar, you mentioned it's a large piece. So, how do you make out? It's the size as far as depth is concerned or it's the size as far as... Uh, you know, how do you decide that pre-op when you see an MRI like this as to whether you're going to take that fragment out or you're going to be able to fix it? Hey, you need to unmute yourself. I would, uh, you know, also ask for a CT because that gives me a fairly good idea as to its anatomical location. It gives me a better idea of the dimensions. It tells me what is the uh, uh, the uh, host site that I would yeah. have to fix it with. Uh, therefore, the size tell you know it tells me the size. Secondly, even on this, you can make out the degree of uh, subchondral bone as well as uh, the uh, yes and the area below that. So that tells me that this is a fairly big and a fairly uh, deep osteochondral fragment. And uh, I think I should, there doesn't seem to be any discontinuity in, its, uh, uh, in it. And therefore, I think I should be able to uh, go ahead and uh, fix it. So that would be my uh, uh, approach to this. I think that's, that's great. Uh, so those are two great tips. So when you're looking at a fragment, so you need to, of course, the cartilage will be there, but always look for the subchondral bone. And if you're seeing the subchondral bone there, then you know that that bone is really what's going to help you with fixation. Also look for the crater. I think when you see the crater, the crater also, if you see that it's part of bone, then you know that in all probability, you will be able to go ahead and uh, fix it. So what Dinsha, did I do? Dinsha, Dinsha, can yes. I ask one thing? Yes, Deepak. Uh, see, if uh, an adolescent who has a history of fall and he displays an osteochondral fracture coming from lateral femoral condyle, I understand that uh, particular femoral instability was not there, but still there are very, very high chances because I believe that if you see a osteochondral fracture in an adolescent, the first diagnosis is patella dislocation. It can be a one dislocation episode, which may not have led to a recurrence or yeah. may not have had the persistent instability, but yeah. uh, we need to keep that thing in mind. And while planning the surgical procedure, because as if we are going to open it, we yes. have to keep that possibility in mind. Might be you might have more imbrication of the medial retinoculum or something simultaneously right. when you are do, planning yeah. uh, this thing. But I think that possibility has to be kept always. In mind. So when you have an adolescent, sixteen years old, you always there are two classical types. You've got patellofemoral instability giving you patellar fractures or trochlear fractures, and then there's the second group which is exactly this 
which comes from the weight-bearing portion of the lateral femoral condyle. So these are the two classical sites. This patient, of course, did not have a patellar instability or uh, any patellofi model. This was a true uh, lateral femoral condyle lesion. So now, uh, uh, some people talked about arthroscopic. So what do I do? So I, of course, I'm going to start off arthroscopically. So when I do this arthroscopically, I'm trying to see the lesion. And what Dr. Narvekar mentioned is very critical. Is this one piece, two piece? Is it crushed by now? So that's what you're looking for. The second thing you're looking for is, does it have subchondral bone? And as soon as you can see that this has subchondral bone, I think then I'm sure that I'm going to do the fixation. For me, it's almost always an open fixation. So a small mini open approach, put the fragment in place and fix this with bioabsorbable screws, preferably three, because this will give you a rotational uh, sort of control on the fragment. To do this arthroscopically is extremely difficult to control the fragment, to hold it in place, to make sure it doesn't rotate when the screws are going in. It becomes a little difficult arthroscopically. And uh, as we can see, that's the CT scan, which we've done uh, uh, six months later. And by six months, you can see that that bone fragment has completely united out there. You can see the small head out there of that screw. The bone fragments united and that's the area there with that uh, fragment united. So uh, it's not a very common uh, area for a fracture, but it's probably the second most uh, uh, common area for osteochondral fractures in adolescence, the weight-bearing portion of the lateral femoral condyle. So that's an area that I think all of us should be looking out for. And fixation is certainly an option when the fragment is large enough. In short. Yes. Can I just make a comment here regarding the uh, Absolutely. using a bio screw and a metal screw? Yeah. Because uh, whenever there is this type of osteochondral fragment, you know, we are also concerned about the chemical uh, things that occur inside the knee and we are using a biodegradable material along with it. And one really does not know what is the degree of chondrolysis that could occur associated with the resorption, if at all, that occurs with this biodegradable screw. So I think the consensus today is probably shifting away from using uh, biodegradable screws, which we had done earlier, to a metallic screw, which could be even a simple AO cannulated screw, uh, obviously without a washer, but with a little bit of uh, 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 milling it so that you can uh, push it under the cartilage. And maybe two or three months later, because you generally see this your union in about six to eight weeks, you can go back again and maybe even remove it arthroscopically. Uh, any concerns if the fragment doesn't unite and say fragments or collapses, any concerns with that screw in the long run causing problems if you've not taken it out? Yeah, but uh, you should. I mean, the whole idea is that you tell the patient that you're going to take that screw out in two months. As a matter okay. of fact, if this were to collapse, your uh, biodegradable screw is not going to degrade in eight weeks or two months. So if it collapses, you would also have your biodegradable screw, which is out of that fragment, and you would not even know because it is not seen on your x-ray. So as a matter of fact, for these osteochondral fragments, it is probably a better thing where you're doing an intraarticular fixation that you use a metallic screw rather than a biodegradable screw. In fact, metallic screws we use for many, many, many years uh, when yes. we didn't have the bio ones. Yes. But ever since the bioabsorbable ones have come, we've used uh, the bio ones and uh, we've never really had any problem with any osteolysis or any sort of reactions in these. These are, of course, PLLA screws. Um, uh, most of the ones available in the market are PLLA screws. And uh, I think it's important to get the ones which have the head because the head itself gives you compression. So you don't require a washer there. You need to countersink it, which is very important. So as we saw in that arthroscopy image, you must countersink it and this must come and hold on to the subchondral bone. And therefore, you should certainly have nothing there at the cartilage. And as long as you've got that, then that's great. Uh, if it's a nice, robust piece that you're sure is going to unite, something like this, which is acute, uh, the, the advantage, of course, is that you'll never have to go back down for a second uh, arthroscopic uh, screw removal. But if you, I'm, I'm certain you can use a metallic one too. But a metallic one always, you would need to go down at some point. You would need to then. Uh, uh, where the area of countersinking is, usually that's going to get covered off with cartilage. So then you need to take off a little bit of that cartilage, 
identify the head and then take it off. So if you're using metallic screws, absolutely no objection, but you must, must uh, take it out and not uh, let it be as a long-term sort of thing inside that thing. Dinsho, a question here is, can yes. we use a Herbert screw? That's a question from Arun. Uh, Dr. Arun says, uh, can yeah. Herbert be used in such cases? A uh, Herbert screw can also be used, but what you require is a good fragment of bone. So when you're using a Herbert screw, I think your, so your distal threads will be no problem, but you want to make sure that your proximal threads are within that uh, fragment itself, which often the Herbert screws will not have. Yeah. Second thing is the compression that you get from the uh, bio screw. So if you see these bio screws, these bio screws are like any normal screw. And the compression that you get from the head is really what gives it the, uh, the e effect without even a washer. So I think I would prefer a screw which is called as a bio compression screw. And these bio compression screws, I think, are particularly good. Um, uh, you could use a Herbert screw. We've used Herbert screws for many of the uh, osteochondral allografts when we do the same thing. But of course, the, there the bone is uh, much, much more. And having more bone ensures that you're going to get uh, a better sort of fixation. Uh, second question so is... This, this part here, fiber. I think that's what's going to get the compression effect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And have you used some kind of fibrin glue there? Uh, that was no, the, yeah. no, no fibrin glue, nothing. It's just the clot. So as soon as these are uh, acute fractures, it's like an osteochondral fracture. It's an acute fracture. I don't think you require any fibrin glue. The head just needs to be com completely countersunk because we have had the opportunity to do some of these arthroscopies subsequently. And this gets completely covered. So you really can't see where the screw is. So if you're putting a metallic screw and you can't see where it is, you might have to use a C arm and then try and get the exact location because you will need to take off some cartilage to get to the uh, uh, to get your screwdriver to engage in the screw and then take it out. Uh, for those who have not used it, uh, Dinsha, it, does it come with a, a, a guide wire or you just put it by after drilling? So these are solid, they're not cannulated. Uh, so the new ones now, I believe are cannulated too, but I haven't used those. I use the solid ones. So you use a guide wire and you then use a drill bit. So that is cannulated, but you need to take that guide wire off and then put the screw in because the screw itself is not cannulated. It needs to be solid. Otherwise, it's not going to be strong enough. And the, do you uh, need to tap? You generally, you need you to generally tap? get them, uh, IPS, you generally get them in one particular size. So if you're going to be using for these femoral condyles, it's okay, you can go deep. The problem is when you're using it, say, on the patella, then you would have probably a part of the tip of that screw coming out from the anterior surface of that patella. That's the only other uh, problem with these. Yeah. So, of, so you get lots of screw sizes, but often you won't, if, uh, you may not always have all the screw sizes. So if you've, uh, so that could be also a challenge at times. And that, uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Narvika mentioned is very true. So if that happens, you uh, cut it off. The good part about that is that uh, you can easily cut it off. So pass it in, make sure that it's uh, depressed well inside. And then from the superficial part of the patella where it's protruding out, you just need a scissor and cut it off. Just the last question, Dr. Ramakant asked that, uh, was there no patellar lesions in this case? When no patellar did... lesions in this but, case. Okay, yeah. good. So we can go to the next case, uh, Dinsha. Okay, so the next case, this is a young boy. And as you can see, see his patella. So, his, so he's a 10 year old boy. And that patella is clunking every time he goes to 30 degrees. So at 30 degrees, he finds that there's a sudden clunk. This is not a medial lateral type of a J sign clunk. This is a superior medial type of clunk. And he's had absolutely no injury at all. So no injury, a clunk in his knee. He's now getting pain. And that's what his scanogram and x-ray looks like. His alignment is normal. When I evaluate his patellofemoral stability, he's got no apprehension. Patellofemoral stability is perfectly all right. And he's had no episode of any patellar instability. Uh, Deepak, any clues from the x-ray that you'd like to give us? The only thing which I can remember is juvenile OCD of patella or proclea that can cause this in adolescence. Okay, so we go sure. to the- I need yeah. more pictures to confirm that. Okay, so we go now to the uh, patella actual view. And uh, Santosh, anything yeah, that you'd so like to add? Just... Yeah. 
संतोष क्या नॉट रियली नॉट रियली ओके गुड वी डू सी समथिंग देयर दैट लुक्स अ लिटिल अनयूजुअल बट वी नॉट लाइक शो आई एग्री आई एग्री को सी डी और नो ट्रू सो आई वुड so that 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 certainly looks a little unusual to me yes yes but uh, i will go to an mri so that's the mri there and uh, we know what do you think it is so these are not very common so uh, the first time i saw them i was also scratching my head and i could see that there's this particular fragment that seems to have come off from the patella from the patella you can see the patella is there there's this right, big right. bump as the subchondral line out there yeah. and uh, seems to be broken off so that's the piece that's broken off and uh, deepak your diagnosis now probably ocd of patella uh, it is it is ocd adolescent ocd of patella yeah. so this is an adolescent uh, ocd of the patella patella we got a ct scan done and uh, his symptoms were of course only on one side but his other side also had it it was there in the x ray too but he has absolutely no uh, symptoms on the left he had only symptoms on the right and we can see that he basically had a, a grade 4 on the right and a grade 2 on the left the question to you now is you know that it's an ocd it's an ocd of the patella how would you treat this ocd would you do an open ocd fixation with or without bone grafting would you do an excision arthroscopically with bone marrow stimulation would you do a mosaic plasty or would you do a bmac or an aci for this patient i think all all four are probably valid options what would you do in this adolescent patient okay Yeah, let's see the result. An OCD fixation uh, with bone grafting. So that's that's interesting. Um, OCD excision with bone marrow stimulation and an ACI. So all of these are really uh, valid options. Uh, Dr. Narvekar, what would you choose for this? Uh, I have uh, chosen the uh, open OCD fixation. but i would obviously first uh, you know two three things i think i would do before i go into surgery maybe i would get a proper scanogram done and see if there is any proximal uh, malalignment or anything uh, you know uh, problem with his uh, entire uh, kinetic chain because he has this bilaterally so there might might be some sort of a mechanical predisposition to it so i'm just sort of forewarned so the scanogram is there the scanogram is there scanogram is all right so i've okay. done all the axes scanogram is okay okay so then of course i would do the arthroscopy that would give me a fairly good idea as to its uh, location etc yeah and then uh, it seems to be central more central and little distal rather than uh, and then i would obviously uh, you know do an open uh, fixation of this clean up the uh, base fairly well and uh, i think it even this fragment has a fairly decent amount of uh, bone underneath it and uh, and therefore i think i would use uh, one of these uh, now for the patella i would definitely use uh, one of the uh, biodegradable screws and darts you get these darts which can use uh, very well uh, and in so fixing it initially as to fix it with uh, uh, just a vicryl but uh, one can use one of these darts okay deepak your choice uh see my first choice be the removal of uh, the piece and uh, because he is very young patient 17 year old and uh, i think uh, doing a bike micro fracture will be good enough to provide him early recovery and uh, good amount of fibro cartilage with mix of fallen cartilage that can be producible but of course i will keep patient in confidence that he might require mosaic plasty if micro fracture fails why i am choosing micro fracture in this case is because his main problem is clunk at present if i remove the piece and if there is a good fibro cartilage regeneration i think he will have a good pain free joint and of course the second option was a plastic will be there why i will not choose ocd fixation it is quite a separated piece the subchondral bone is dead the subchondral because the subchondral bone is dead even if you try to fix it it will definitely fail so i will not fix it i will remove it and do it micro fracture as first choice mosaic plastic second choice okay um 
So I think uh, what Deepak mentioned, uh, that that's the reason actually I got that CT scan done. Uh, so what's very well known with these particular OCDs is that it's a chronic process and the, you know children come to you a little late. And by the time they come to you, often you will have a significant amount of lysis of the bed, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the bone bed of the OCD. So often you'll find this scenario that when it is a separated type four ICRS OCD, by that time, that bone is already gone. And therefore, if you're doing a fixation, often you'll need to do some sort of bone grafting in this area. Otherwise, this piece is not going to sit perfectly there. It tends to get either compressed and therefore would be non-anatomic and leaving a gap there. So I think that's the real challenge uh, as far as these particular OCDs uh, are concerned. So I went in. So what did I do? So I went in with an arthroscopic approach thinking, we'll see if that fragment looks okay. I might think of a fixation, but if I'm going to do a fixation, I'm going to require bone grafting. But if it doesn't, then for a child at this age, at you know nine years, 10 years, I felt that a BMS would be the best uh, possible option. So uh, that's, that's what we see. That's the arthroscopy. And uh, in arthroscopy, you can see that that whole piece is uh, completely out. It's just hinged on one side, and that's why it's causing that clunk. Looking at it from the superior portal there, again, you'll see that that's the piece there that comes out like a balloon, and uh, that's the reason he's getting that clunk with the pain. So first, I put my probe in, tried to see what that was like, and whether I would actually be able to achieve anything below. Once I was more or less convinced that, look, this is not look like, look like, looking like a good scenario where I can get the piece off, do the bone grafting, I thought I better just take this out. So I took that piece out and then did exactly what Deepak uh, mentioned. I think these younger children, so that's the piece there, really very little bone and uh, all filled up with this fibrous tissue. So the whole bed, full of fibrous tissue. So I took out all that fibrous tissue. And then you'll see that that piece really is much smaller than the crater. So considering that the piece would be much smaller than the crater and I wasn't really going to get a good sort of, uh, sort of congruity, I thought uh, Deepak's option was probably the best. Do a microfracture. It's a 10-year-old boy. Uh, I'm not so keen on doing uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation. Uh, uh, yes. Truly speaking, uh, mosaic plasty is also possible, but to get good congruity in such a large patellar lesion would be difficult, especially in the central ridge. In this area, to get that would be difficult. So I did a microfracture. You could see that there was a nice, good bleeding bed out there. So we've got the whole thing filled up with the super clot. And uh, of course, this clunk immediately went away. And when we look at that 12-month follow-up MRI, we can see that that's the fibrocartilage that's come out there. So that's the fibrocartilage come there. You can see those uh, deep sort of K wire holes, which I've made two of them so that we get a good clot. And uh, that's his MRI, which again shows us this, that that was his whole bed. And this is the fibrocartilage that's filled up. I'm a little disappointed that the whole thing is not really perfectly congruous, something that we see with the bone marrow stimulation technique. So you can see that it's filled up but it's not got that perfect congruity that we often find with our ACIs. But certainly the patient is asymptomatic. He's not clunking. He's not got pain and uh, seems uh, uh, happy with it. And he has now about a, a four to five year follow-up and he's quite uh, okay with it. So surprisingly, the other side, we still haven't done. And the other side is still stuck at grade two. So Santosh, uh, would you do anything for the other side at this stage where he's asymptomatic and it's got a uh, stage two OCD and uh, would you do anything at this stage or would you just let it be? Uh, no, not at this stage if he's asymptomatic. Maybe we could have drilled it uh, on the same city uh, when you had noticed it, the other side, but not now, not to go in when he's asymptomatic. If he turns out to be symptomatic or if the MRI shows but consistent progress in stage, maybe to stage three, then go in, not at stage two. What about you, uh, 
Vinod, would you do anything for that asymptomatic left patel? No, no. I think I agree with Dr. Santos. If yeah. patient is having no symptoms, then I don't think we should intervene. Yeah, that's exactly what I did too. So he's had no symptoms. I've just left him alone. And uh, I'm just waiting. I'm almost certain that someday he will land up with the same uh, scenario. Deepak, uh, would you do any prophylactic fixation at that for the asymptomatic side? No, I think we treat patients, not MRI. Perfect. So if there is asymptomatic, no need. Perfect. So that's the reason we've left it alone. And we'll wait and we'll watch. Okay, case. Dinsha, just, so, Dinsha, yes. Yes. Dinsha uh, I just want to know the patella fragment. Obviously, yeah. you could have just kept the hinge on on one side and you could have grafted and fixed it open. The advantage is that you would have landed up probably with a highline cartilage rather than now depending upon a fibro cartilage and which you know in due course of time is probably going to give way and you would probably need to do something. Here also you are taking a chance. So there is always a chance of a second fixation or a second uh, surgery, whatever it may be, whether it is mosaic or whether it is ACI in future. But at least uh, the thing is that because it is hinged, you can see that it is hinged on one side. You could have just yeah. opened that hinge, put in some bone grafts and fixed it so that that irregularity which is there, which is giving him the symptoms could have gone. It is basically mechanical. Absolutely. So mechanical. Absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, completely. In fact, I must have spent almost 15 or 20 minutes intraoperatively trying to take that call. Should I go ahead that way or not? Because really speaking, that was my primary line of management. You know, I'd already uh, got uh, his iliac crest, uh, you know, painted and draped. And that was the primary line of management of which I was thinking. So I kept thinking, should we do it? Should we not do it? Should we do it? Should we not do it? And the problem was this. That when you when you take the probe and you're looking at it, uh, I could make out that the fragment was basically extremely unstable, number one. And number two, I was almost certain that I would not get that congruity. Seeing the uh, CT scan, seeing the MRI, uh, that was the whole fear that, of course, I'm going to have to bone graft. If I'm going to fix it, I'm going to have to bone graft. But at the end of that procedure also, if I'm not got a completely nice congruous patella, he's going to still have pain. He's going to still have uh, the clunking. And there would be, a, I thought, a 50-50 chance that this would fail. So considering that, I took that decision that, look, with a 50-50 chance that I would fail, I would much rather get the fragment out and do a BMS, which I'm almost certain will give him a great short-term outcome. Exactly what you say is in my mind as far as the long-term outcome is concerned with a BMS. I really don't know how he's going to be maybe 10 years or 15 years from now. He's not clunking. He's got no pain. I suspect that this is okay, but we really, really don't know. So I, I completely concur with your uh, views on that. I can I add to your comment? Yes. Uh, it is just to answer Abhay's query. Abhay, if it is a chondral separation of the piece, which is fresh, I will totally rely that if it is a purely chondral piece, and if I put it on the bone, it will heal. But OCD is a chronic condition. And if you look at the cartilage, there is no bone on it. So you cannot expect a bone grafted bone with an old cartilage piece, which is already started, you know, avascular, to get healed with the bone. So had it been a bone involved remaining with the piece, we could have taken a chance of fixing it with the base with addition of bone grafting. It might have worked. But because it is a pure chondral piece and because it is chronic, there are very poor chance of this piece getting stuck to the bone, number one. Second, you said we already took a chance of doing microfracture in this case. But if you fix it, do the bone grafting and fix it, the chances of failure is very soon. It is knocking your door within a few months. And in this case, the failure is for years away. So, you know, patient satisfaction is also important and you are not sure. As Dinshaw said, he took 50-50 chance. But I expect that it is 70-80% chance that patient will not come back. 10-20% chance that patient will come back. That, that's my opinion. Yeah, that's great. Dinshaw, there is a question. In the yes. x-ray post-op, it seems like you have drilled transpetalar. I mean, it's a through-and-through yeah, through yeah. drilling. So, yes, if you yes, can yes. just... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what I did was microfracture... When I found that I didn't get such a great super clot, because I always want to see a nice big super clot, 
I then did a percutaneous drilling with a K wire and two holes, one year and one year, superior part of the defect and inferior part of the defect, because then really I started getting the good bleeding out there because I want a good big super clot coming out there. So uh, yes, so that's the whole uh, bone marrow stimulation. Yeah, if you find that you're not getting enough, you haven't got enough depth with the microfracture all, which I, uh, which I faced, and yes, uh, these are the two drill holes that I've done percutaneously right through and through. And just two words about maybe a rehab pro protocol. That's the question which is coming. So did you immobilize these guys? or not? Um, uh, so no real immobilization. For okay. pain relief, just two or three days uh, that I would keep a patient like this uh, without range. He just gets into a long leg brace. And uh, uh, just two or three days, only because you don't want that super clot to dislodge. And after two or three days, you start range. But you make sure that this is a patellofemoral lesion. You don't go beyond 60 degrees for the first four weeks. So while it's maturing out there, you don't want increased patellofemoral joint pressure. So you certainly don't want him to go beyond 90. And these kids are always going to get their range back. So go slow on beyond 60 for the first uh, four weeks. And just a last question before we go. Uh, how do you hit right area from outside? Did you use a zig? Yeah. So if you've got a small area, then you use a simple jig and you use something like an ACL jig, which is a low profile jig. And you come up to the subchondral bone and then you just about tap it, tap it, tap it. You don't want to go through and through, otherwise you'll go out. But for such a large lesion, you really don't even require a jig. You just need to make sure that you've got your three-dimensional idea of where the patella is. And based on where the patella is, then you come in. I would suggest that you don't, so you do this drilling, you come up to this point here. And then as soon as you feel that you've crossed the first uh, cortex, then I just gently tap it in. The second thing that I like to do is with a spatula or with a Freer's elevator, I like to lift the patella up. So this way you're keeping uh, a gap between the patella and the uh, trochlea. And this also forms something like a barrier or a retractor so that when that guide wire comes in, it doesn't go into the cartilage. So you need to be a little slow at that step. That's a great tip. Thank you very much. Yadish. In short, when you, when you come back, maybe whatever yes. time when he comes back with the pain, hopefully after the age of his uh, growth plates having fused, yeah. are you going to be counseling him for a tibial transplant? Whatever you do for the patella, would you also be doing anything to his tibial tuberosity in terms of, you know, depending on the... It. If he's asymptomatic, I don't want to do any profile. No, no, I'm talking about five years down the line, seven yeah. years, whenever no, no, he no, gets... I'm saying, yeah, he, he, He'd say even 20 years down the line, if he comes to me and he's asymptomatic, uh, I would I would rather not do a tibial. So you mean basically like a MACA procedure to offload the patellofemoral joint? Is that it? Only when he's painful. That's what I'm saying. Any yeah. pain after the age of 18 or 20, if he comes with pain and you decide to do anything for the patella because of the pain, will you also be doing something to the tibial tuberosity in terms of elevating it or you know whatever? I, osteotomy with elevation. See, because basically, if you're doing it, you're going to have to do just an elevation. As you can see, if you try and do uh, anteromedialization, it's going to probably, this lesion is a huge lesion. It's there on the medial side, it's there at the ridge, and it's there laterally. These are exactly the lesions where we find this kind of a postoperative MRI. Because the ridge never comes back, if when you're doing a microfracture, it'll come back with an ACI, but will not come back with a microfracture. I think that's the concern. Uh, would I do something which would be offloading the patellofemoral joint? Would depend on what the picture of the patella is. So if the patella had good cartilage, so the cartilage repair has succeeded, has not failed in the long run, then that would be my only option. If we have activity modification, if that didn't work, I'd have to offload with a MACA type of procedure. But if I found that really the cartilage had gone away and the cartilage is the cause, then I would have to do both. I would have to offload it and at the same time think of a autologous chondrocyte implantation. One stage. Okay, so we go to the next case. Okay. Yeah. Case three. This is a 22-year-old footballer and he's having persistent knee pain and effusion following a slight tackle injury. So he's had that, he's had a slight tackle injury, he's had a procedure already done, 
nine months back. So he was having pain, swelling. He's undergone an arthroscopic loose fragment removal uh, at his hometown. And there they had done a chondroplasty nine months back. And he comes to me after nine months saying, look, I still have pain. I still have swelling. Uh, every time I try and run, I get effusions in my knee and I cannot play. And he's a competitive player. So a competitive football player who's already undergone an arthroscopic chondroplasty, coming to you at nine months, I get his MRI done. That's what his MRI looks like. So on the MRI, we can see that he has a lateral femoral condyle lesion. This is the area where he has no cartilage at all. He's undergone a chondroplasty, but I don't see any deep drill holes there, but I can see some small sort of marks there, which indicate that yes, he certainly underwent a BMS. And we can see that this is the area of the lesion. So it's about two to two centimeters here by about nine to 10 millimeters in the uh, coronal. So whole question, what would you do for this patient? Would you consider waiting and persist with rehab? Will you tell him, look, it's only nine months, let's wait and watch. Uh, you're a competitive footballer, you may lose the season, but this would be the better way to go. Would you think of some sort of injection in his knee, a steroid or a PRP? Would you think of a revision bone marrow stimulation? Would you think of a mosaic plasty? Or would you say, look, I think this is a good indication for an ACI? So maybe get the poll uh, question there, Sandeep. Yeah. So five options. Wait and watch, persist with rehab, injection, BMS, mosaic plasty, ACI. Sandeep, what do we have? Seventy-one percent mosaic plasty. Some would say, "Look, let's just inject him, try and see if we can get him out of the season. Then we'll take care of it." And uh, fourteen percent uh, would wait. Okay, so uh, we know that I'm going to ask you, "What was your option? What would you do?" Uh, yeah, my <laughs> option was uh, mosaic plasty. Maybe okay. this arthroscopic or open depends on complexity of situation. Yeah. But uh, the criteria here is that uh, he's a competitive sports person. Secondly, the defect is uh, around two centimeters square or less. Yeah. So considering these, and he's fairly young guy. So probably for demanding persons, young sportsmen, if defect is small or medium size, then in my hands, uh, this uh, mojek plasty probably is the most uh, suitable option. Okay, Dr. Narvekar, your option was a mosaic plasty? So we can't hear you. Narvik, sorry, sorry sir, I, I, uh, this thing was to continue waiting and process with rehab. Okay. I think nine months is too short. The MRI at this point does not show any subchondral bone edema or does not show any loading pattern in that. Yeah. And therefore, I don't think that his pain is directly coming from this particular small loss of cartilage. There seems to be a certain amount of cartilage on top of that subchondral bone. Yeah. So I would wait before I do something later. Okay. He's nine months. He's lost one season. He's saying, you know, I'm going to lose a second season if you're going to be make me wait. What are the chances that I will get back? Can you assure me I'm going to get back? And so that was also my plan. Wait for some time. Okay. Uh, Deepak. What would you do? See, the best results of microfractures are at one year or two years, and then they fail. Nine months has already passed. If microfracture has to give any good results, it should have been there by now. If there are no results of microfracture by nine months, I don't think there are going to be better results. Number two, there is no bone marrow activity seen. If there is no bone marrow activity, that means there is nothing going further to heal it. It has healed whatever it was supposed to heal, it has healed. Number three, there is already a defect, full thickness defect on lateral femoral condyle. And if it has not shown any fibrocartilage formation now, it is not going to show that formation later on. So considering the active sportsman, load-bearing joint, less than two centimeter size defect, active patient sportsman, mosaic plasty will give him one single shot and he's done. The long-term results of the procedure between OCT, ACI and MF, OCT has got the maximum return to sports percentage as compared to other activities. So being a sportsman, osteochondral cylinder transfer should be the choice. Okay. 
So I went ahead with the arthroscopy. I knew I'm going to do something. So that's the arthroscopy there. His ligaments are all right. Meniscus is fine. That's the lesion there. Certainly, uh, BMS was tried, but you can see there's some, you know, little bit of fibrocartilage which has possibly come out there. But uh, as we see in that MRI, it's not really filled up. Question to all of you again, after you do the diagnostic arthroscopy, would you still stick to the same thing or has someone changed their mind? I will stick, still yeah. stick with there at one. Okay. Santosh, please, please Santosh, what about you? I'll stick to my plan of mosaic plasty because that is mosaic a clear plasty. Plasty, okay. which is not uh, good enough to take the load for a high demand athlete. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see the results there. So I think it's going to be identical. Continue with rehab. Oh, wow. So after the arthroscopy, <laughs> we do have many more who would say that they would rather uh, continue and persist uh, with rehab. So I think it's uh, it's it's a great uh, sort of, I, I, that's I think the difficult scenario there when someone's already done the procedure and you're always hoping that you can, you know, get away with it. Uh, it, and nine months are over, especially in a competitive athlete, sometimes you're caught with this scenario. If we wait, will we achieve what we want to wait or get? Or is it going to waste more time and then are we going to have to come back? So uh, I opted straight away for a mosaic plasty because I thought that if I did a mosaic, I could give him for all the reasons that Deepak mentioned. You know, you can get highline cartilage there in the weight-bearing portion. Uh, he didn't have any malalignment. So plain, simple, two-plug Mosaic Plasty is going to give him the required immediate sort of pain relief and get him back to sports. Uh, one thing to note, ACI doesn't have the same sort of results uh, as a, pr a primary ACI will not uh, will be much better than an ACI in a patient in whom a prior microfracture has been done and has not succeeded. We know that from literature, so ACI is not a good option, plus the sportsman who wants to get back immediately. So that's his... Uh, post-op that we did at 12 months. Actually, he started playing at four months. At four months, uh, he was already uh, relatively pain-free. And uh, I was a little concerned when he came to me at 12 months saying that he had already been playing since the last uh, six months and he was training since the last uh, eight months. So I got an MRI done. MRI showed us that that had healed uh, quite well. Both the uh, plugs had healed and uh, no real issue. So I think in sports persons, a mosaic plasty is a great option to get them on their feet quickly. That subchondral bone heals quick. You get good highline cartilage and up to and any lesion which can accept up to two plugs, I think is a great option for uh, mosaic plasty. Uh, any questions on this IPS? Yeah, Dinsha, question is that uh, how do you decide that the patient can go for sports? I mean, do you do a follow-up MRI and uh, see the signs of healing before allowing them to go into sports? Uh, normally, I would like to do a clinical evaluation. So if the patient has been completely pain-free, he's, of course, doing all his strength training, he's got back his abilities, uh, usually do a clinical evaluation, see that he's not had any pain and effusion. But for us, I think a lot of the times when we get these patients who come from outside Bombay, when they're feeling all right and their local physio is taking care of them, Often they don't come back also. The local physio then gets them to start running, jumping, playing. And he came back uh, actually for a shoulder injury that he had sustained in AC joint grade one, one year after this procedure. And then we told him, you know, what about your knee? You've not come in for any follow-ups. He said, yeah, because I had no problem at all. So typically I would like to go on a clinical evaluation. And based on the clinical evaluation, if everything is good, I typically get an MRI done for a sportsman before he gets back into sports. I don't think it's mandatory, but I think it's worthwhile at least to have that evidence that your procedure has uh, succeeded. And uh, typically for cartilage lesions also, for good follow-up, I like to get a one-year and a two-year sort of MRI done to see how they are proceeding uh, uh, longitudinally. So first follow-up MRI is six months, uh, if we get six it right. Months. One year, two years. That's for cartilage. Okay. That's yeah. perfect. And the donor site here was uh, uh, why not an intercondylar notch? That's the question. Uh, because when you take it from the intercondylar notch, basically you're trying to get the three-dimensional congruity of your condyle. And the intercondylar notch tends to give you either a flat or a concave sort of congruity. 
So you put in the plug, but that plug would have cartilage that looks like this. Whereas if you take it from the medial femoral condyle, it gives you a convex plug. And so with that convex plug, you're more likely to get the congruity that you require. So that's why I think that it's worthwhile to take it from the medial femoral condyle. Okay, I think very so large that. lesions. If there are very large lesions, and uh, you know, when we didn't have ACI, I think that's when I used to take it from the uh, intercondylar notch area because then you had no option. Okay, so we can go to the next adventure. Case four. So uh, this is a 33 year old female. So 33 year old female, and she's been having pain on the medial side of her knee going on since almost a year and now it's significant she's limping and that's why she's come she's had two or three episodes of effusion we get her x-ray done the x-ray showing us a medial femoral condyle ocd out there the weight bearing x-ray also shows us that that medial joint space is reduced we get a scanogram done and that scanogram is showing us that she is in varus an MPTA of 82. We get an MRI done, and that MRI there again shows us that she's got a deep uh, osteochondritis dissecans of the medial femoral condyle. So it's a deep lesion there. That's the sag cut there. I'm going to do a, you all of us know that we're going to do an arthroscopy for this patient. Uh, so I've gone ahead done the arthroscopy for this patient. That's that dead piece that I've taken out. This lesion is eight millimeters thick. So what we've got is a 34 year old female, medial femoral condyle OCD, which is eight millimeters thick. The size of the lesion you've already seen, it's about 22 by 16 and she's in varus. So how are you gonna treat this young lady? Are you going to do a BMS for this lesion? Are you going to do a BMS with a high tibial osteotomy? Are you going to do a mosaic plasty? Or an ACI with or without bone grafting with a high tibial osteotomy? Or are you thinking of some other treatment option? Are you thinking of a HTO or a uni knee replacement either now or, you know, uh, uh, in the future. So let's get the poll question up. Sandeep, can we have that? This is a complex case. Okay, so let's see the result. So mosaic plasty uh, with an HTO. As we can see, no one's opted for a bone uh, ACI, just bone grafting. So I think everyone's opted for a HTO. So I think HTO, the message is, is a must. Now the question of whether you're going to do this with a BMS or a mosaic plasty or an ACI is the option. So uh, Deepak, what did you choose? I chose ACI with a HTO. Okay, any particular reason why you didn't think of a mosaic plasty? Because it is too large a lesion, number one. And then secondly, it is eight millimeter deep. So of course I can choose 15 millimeter depth size mosaic plasty plugs, but then putting I, the lesion looks like that I will need four plugs minimum, four or five plugs. So to have four or five plugs with 15 millimeter length is too much for the to harvest. And just putting a bone graft and putting ACI on top of it will be more easy procedure as compared to mosaic plastic. Anyway, STO okay. has to be done in whatever we choose. But the main Dr. thing is the large size lesion, so STOs uh, and mosaic plastic should not be done. Okay, Dr. Narvekar, your choice? My choice was uh, mosaic with uh, HTO. Okay. Like because uh, anyway, you're going to be doing an HTO, so you're going to do this mosaic open. And yes. I think uh, larger lesions can be done open. You can take it from medial, lateral, intercondylar, etc. So you're able to fit it far better than this thing. So this would be about, uh, I would say, uh, between, you know, this is the uh, end of what you would do for a mosaic. Anything bigger okay. than this, maybe you would not. Absolutely. I'm sure you have the maximum sort of, uh, you know, uh, sort of experience with these really large 
uh, medial femoral condyle lesions, uh, which I know you've done uh, mosaics for. So give us some of your experience for this. What's the maximum plug uh, uh, that, you would, that you would put? How many plugs do you think you can put? It's a combination. So I use 6.5, 4.5. Correct. Okay, so before that, you can put your, you know, in different ways, you take that universal guide and you put it over there. You make those imprints on it, on the okay. donor site. So once you make those okay, imprints, so you know how many plugs you would require. And for the deep lesions like this, again, would you use a 4.5 or would you like to go for the larger plug sizes? No, I, I basically use 6. Point, I don't have, I have only very rarely used 8.5. That is, you okay. know, because the mosaic has just come recently with 8.5. Smith right. But they so have been otherwise having 6.5 and 4.5. So 6.5, you would be putting in, uh, uh, in, in more, more of the central portions that you put the 6.5. Correct. And then you take the peripheries where you put in the 4.5s. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, basically, more often than not, this uh, turns out to be a, a sort of a hybrid procedure because you yeah. are not really with this curvature able to completely cover it like uh, Hangodi, you know, the whole thing very yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Agreed. there is obviously some degree of uh, high, high line and some degree of fibrocartilage that forms. But if you were to do the arthroscopy, maybe three, four years later, you would find very little uh, difference. You know, the whole thing fills up fairly well. Okay. What about you, Vinod? What's your choice Vinod is muted Vinod is muted Vinod yeah uh, sorry so uh, I think uh, I am audible now yeah yes yes Vinod yeah so my option uh, is basically HTO as uh, uh, yeah. everybody is agree on that yes but for uh, cartilage uh, in this type of situation I will prefer only the bone marrow stimulation by microfracture and uh, uh, my criteria for that or logic is that C is already a, a you can say the middle aged female low 34, demand. 34, 34. So but, she's younger than all of us. No, no, she may be younger, but uh, her knee is not younger. Okay. But if there is a degeneration <laughs> is already there and yeah. the joint space has gone, so yeah. probably this may be a focal defect grade four, but even yeah. the other the, the adjacent cartilage must go on already under uh, grade two or something grade three changes. So if there is a degeneration already there up to the extent which has given a significant virus, yeah. then probably by HTO is the, yeah. is the, is the procedure of uh, main concern, which will yes. unload this and yes. change the weight bearing on the other side and decompress this joint compartment. And uh, by any procedure means maybe even ACI, uh, I may not expect the highline cartilage grow back again in a degenerated situation. So okay. I'll go with the with the least uh, invasive, invasive. And economical economical option that is the microfracture, and I expect uh, uh, fairly okay means good results uh, which may help this lady okay. at least for a couple of years. So I, I get your logic completely. So you're going to do basically an offloading of the joint. You're going to do an HTO and you're going to depend on your HTO. And because you've offloaded the medial side, you feel that it doesn't matter what you do. It will fill yeah. up and therefore you, you'll do a debridement. Okay, yeah. acceptable. Uh, what about you, Santosh? Yeah, my second choice was uh, ACI, but my first choice will be uh, mosaic with HTO being a single staged procedure. That's one advantage of doing a mosaic with an HTO. Okay. And uh, I liked uh, Dr. Navake's statement, don't try to do a hangodi. Uh, try to space it out. You might not be able to recreate whatever hangodi does. Yeah. Uh, use larger graphs because you need a longer plugs here, 15 yeah. to 20. Yeah. And uh, sometimes a uh, hybrid, uh, I've done uh, sometimes uh, use a mosaic. If you're not able to fill it up, add a BMAC over it so that you can give a better contour. You still okay. have an highlight. Uh, added on to an higher than like cartilage. So the quality of cartilage is better. Okay, fine. So what did I do? I did uh, what Deepak said. I did a ACI with a bone grafting with an HTO. I thought that this girl is quite young. She's 34. We need to, of course, do an HTO for sure. But I certainly wanted good cartilage there, which I was sure I wouldn't get with a BMS. I didn't want to do a move mosaic plasty because I felt that she's already got degeneration. So some patlofemoral changes are already going to be there. She's got no symptoms in the patlofemoral joint. And I don't want to take out so many plugs and deep plugs and land up with a problem. So the technique that I use straight away, it's an open approach, of course. And uh, this lesion is too deep for just an ACI. So any ACI, uh, when your lesion is beyond seven millimeters, you need to bone graft it. 
the other thing that uh, was very clearly uh, seen by Vinod is that, of course, this is the lesion, but surrounding the lesion also, this is the real size of the lesion because this also doesn't have cartilage. So here, there's no bone loss, but it's a huge, you know, sort of uh, defect. So I took out from the suprapatella area itself, the bone graft, since this was open, so the standard ports. So I took just bone from the suprapatella area and took uh, these two 10 mm uh, plugs and uh, using the classical oats technique. So this is a punch fit sort of uh, process. So that bone graft goes in like you would do for uh, uh, a mosaic. So you've got two large 10 mm pegs which have been press fit in there. And then once that was press fit, uh, this, so I've got a good bone bed now. I made the holes in the adjoining area. And these holes again are so that your ACI can get its rotational stability there. So you can see it's a big thing, almost a full condyle. And then once I've done that, I started putting the ACI in. So a fibrin ACI. And uh, I think all, all of you must have noted in the X-ray too. So some osteophytes are already developing on the medial side. So that's why I think that uh, doing an HTO was critical. Without an HTO, this patient would not have certainly done well. So that's the sort of uh, ACI that we've got on top of our bone graft. Then the um, uh, same stage went ahead with a uh, high tibial osteotomy. So remember in the first stage, I've taken out that fragment, taken the ACI biopsy, and then nothing done thereafter. Second stage in one shot, open bone grafting with ACI with HTO. You can see the area where I've taken out that bone graft from, so you need to take it out from this area. You could also do it from the iliac crest, but usually if I'm going to do two, then I take it out from this uh, um, uh, uh, from the uh, suprapatellar area itself. And then that's the HTO there. That's the patient at six months. So at six months, that lesion, you can see uh, the bone graft has united. So the bone graft's united there. The osteotomy is also united. That wedge hasn't gone as yet at six months. And by 24 months, when we've taken the plate out, we've then done the uh, MRI at that stage. And you can see that's the, so the bone graft has almost completely united. And so the bone graft was much more, and that's all united and almost remodeled. And that's the whole area of the ACI. We can still see an interface there between the normal cartilage and the uh, uh, ACI. And still see an interface there, but the laminar tendons, the limiting membrane has come so beautifully. You can see that well in this MRI. And uh, this patient's got good cartilage there. And this patient is now exactly uh, got a nine-year follow-up. So uh, nine years, she's been doing extremely well. Uh, of course, activity modification, weight control, and all of that's there. But most importantly, she's pain-free and uh, managing quite well. Uh, then the question, question, can, yeah, yeah. question is that can't you take a graft from the proximal tibia? Graft from the proximal tibia? When uh, you're doing osteotomy anyway. True, you could, but you're going to do a medial opening wedge osteotomy there. And, uh, you know, that soft cancellous bone there in the proximal tibia. I think the area in the, uh, you know, the supracondylar region there gives you much better bone. So that bone... Uh, is really nice, strong bone, because you want a nice uh, bone bed out there. Without a good bone bed, I don't think you should be putting your graft in. Uh, so if you see this, you can see that this, so the periosteum, of course, is taken off. So the periosteum is taken off, and this is the sort of cortical area that you punch in. Don't put the pencil soft area up. You want something that's uh, going to be a good sort of a uh, bed out there. I think uh, this supracondylar area is a much better area for bone graft. When you're going to do an HTO, your screws are going to go there. You want a good fixation in that area. So I wouldn't like to take these large pegs, 10 millimeter, two large pegs out from that area. I, I wouldn't want that. Uh, okay. I think uh, the uh, ilia crest would be the best possible option. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do okay, some so of the these patients have a vitamin D deficiency? That's the question. Vitamin deficiency. Uh, I think a lot of our patients in India have a vitamin D deficiency, and you must, of course, give them uh, vitamin D. But uh, I don't think that that's going to be, you mean, just as a cure? Yeah, I mean, uh, cartilage supplements, and supplements. because these, these are blisters, I mean, this is the question which has come. 
okay they are not sports guys so you can just maybe so that's a question i mean i just asked you would you treat this just with a vitamin d no i think you need to restore the articular cartilage uh, long term wise i think you do require first of all offloading so the hto but i think most importantly you require articular cartilage in this area if this whole area doesn't have articular cartilage that could be uh, a problem so yeah. yes uh, vitamin d supplementation is fine but uh, that wouldn't be just the only treatment i wouldn't treat this patient with just a uh, 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 medication perfect i think we can go to the next question uh, okay. so message there any malalignment with cartilage always do a hto does uh, any one of you have uh, experience of uh, also using prp with this uh, when you are doing it either with the bone pegs pushing the bone pegs inside or prp with mosaic uh, i don't know deepak Do you have any like evidence to... for that? No, no I evidence. Would, CRP, no I evidence. just want to know. No okay. evidence as far as whatever literature I have studied. No evidence. Okay. And secondly, when you mix two procedures, you do not know what is going to do what, and to get <laughs> to whom to give the credit. <laughs> so it it always gives you a confused uh, experience for future patients. Yes. So I think it's better yeah, not to yeah, mix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think is a big no for this. I think. Oh, yeah, prp what there you know prp where you are putting the bone plugs inside in order to encourage the union of that bone plug that is what but, i but you do you do you do we really need no, something i don't know i'm to... just asking you because you are the people who use prp i don't no, use it no no what i'm saying is for bone to bone union we do not need anything else nature is good enough no because see what happens is that there is a lot of literature regarding using prp with osteochondral allografts that mm -hmm. of course is a different scenario but i'm mm -hmm. just saying that this is they have shown far better incorporation with prp with allograft so is that true also for using see, these I, type of grafts abhay I, abhay i strongly believe that whatever procedure you are doing if there is no commercial interest to it it doesn't make good so there are lots of paper in literature when they use something autogenous and they put some commercial product into it and then you know it is a bang so do a mosaiclast and do prp so prp company is happy <laughs> but i think the mosaiclast is good enough why put prp in that okay, okay. i think this of prp in any where doesn't hold good i don't know about anywhere but just, certainly in this situation <laughs> i would not put any prp i'm <laughs> again putting <laughs> dinsha don't be diplomatic come <laughs> come <straight. laughs> just one yes. point about prp <laughs> the clinic because just one point basic science they use prp a lot but not clinically PRP yes. is a good scaffold for cartilage culturing. Uh, so, on the basic science part of it, PRP is actually good scaffold. But uh, clinical side, we are not sure currently. Dinsa, so, exactly, I've got a question, exactly. to, I have one, one uh, question. Got a question to you. Yes. At this present point of time in 2020, do you have any indication for PRP in your clinical practice today? Okay, so I think that would be a complete. We'll be going on a tangent in a cartilage. Uh, that's a whole <laughs> webinar on itself. I do have indications for PRP today too. Uh, I do use uh, PRP in certain situations. There's a there's some amount of literature which does support that. But I think going on that will go, get us into a complete tangent from uh, yeah. cartilage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Dinsha, yeah. I'd like to add one uh, thing over here. Yes. Uh, we know the said that he will like to do bone marrow stimulation over here. Yeah. But I think the indication for any bone marrow stimulation procedure is pure chondral defect and not the osteochondral defect. So if there is an osteochondral defect, yes. the very indication of bone marrow stimulation is void. Okay. No, but as he mentioned, as we not mentioned, he was going to rely basically on the HTO. Yes. The HTO no, I, is I, I like it. And I, because he's doing an HTO, he's just going to get the loose piece out so that there's no locking, etc. But he's depending primarily on his offloading to then form, uh, you yeah. know, some fibro cartilage. No, no, I I like this idea very much because we have different types of patient, and some of the patient a simple solution is good enough. So I like this idea. Remove the bone and do the osteotomy, and patient is happy. Yeah. And very conservative surgery and very good. So I like this idea. But just for the theoretical part, that bone marrow stimulation. is not a, is contraindicated when there is osteochondral lesions yeah so, so if this patient could not afford an aci i would yes. be doing exactly what vinod mentioned yes. Yes. if my patient could not afford an aci i'd say okay at least do an hto do yeah. an hto offload the medial side and get that piece out so I agree. i uh, should i say little bit yes please vinod yeah uh, you see i fully agree with dr deepak that probably 
theoretically this aci may look like giving better cartilage healing but you see if you see the literature mainly for these degenerative medial cartilage uh, situation where the virus is there the results of hto hto or hto with micro fracture or hto with uh, aci or something results are uh, not actually compared in that way to justify such a costly procedure there are no evidence on it till date uh, and we know have, uh, just let me complete first and we have a almost uh, 10 to 15 years of experience of doing this osteotomy with micro fracture i agree with you that that micro fracture may not take care of that part of the defect where there is a bone damage but actually this medial compartment is is not a focal defect what it is it is a degenerative and the differential involvement of whole cartilage of femoral condyle is there so you cannot justify by doing any procedure in center uh, which may give as a whole far better results so probably still uh, with our uh, little bit experience uh, i don't agree on the concept that uh, it will actually change the uh, results significantly we justify the cost of the procedure in government setup let no, me uh, dr vinod i totally agree with you and as i said that given your conditions doing osteotomy and my micro fracture is a good choice i i totally agree with that and it depends on patient's expectation how much hyaline yeah. cartilage or rather how much activities the patient expects from the surgery yeah. and yeah. in different setups only micro fracture is good enough and some patients aci can be done if patient is affording my yeah. point is different from this case my comment is yeah. a general yeah. comment yeah. that in That's general accurate. micro fracture is contraindicated when there is a oc yeah. defect definitely yeah. and second comment about that what dr abhay was asking i have experience of two patients where uh, i have not used prp but bmac as a additional procedure with mosaic uh, plasty in a young patient having a very big size of defect where uh, in a, in a time that this aci was banned and i have to use the uh, plugs but probably they were not enough to take care of the whole defect so in the remaining defect i have filled with the beam and it's around two and a half years patient is happy but it's just a, i think one case so it's only one case experience as a hybrid procedure bmac with mosaic in a young patient big defect so that's so just does, a small okay. so does does uh, micro fracture and just a debridement make any difference if you were not to do a micro fracture just debride the base Uh, in, in, you know, in case. indicated cases also, where previously we used to do micro fracture, now with so much of stress being given to the subchondral bone, you yeah, just yeah. don't do anything to the to the subchondral bone. You just do uh, a debridement, and uh, would there really be too much of a difference in terms of the fibrocartilage formation? You see, especially in degenerative virus deformity. Not here, not here, you know, not yeah. here. I'm just asking in general, as so micro fracture as a procedure and debridement as a procedure. No, no, no. You see, debridement is a is a just a uh, you can say nothing but to make the environment conducive. It it never give regeneration. What regeneration happen is far less. If you add the micro fracture, definitely it will be far better than merely debridement. If other things are conducive, so you I can't say that debrima and micro fracture are equal in all scenarios. No. I think you need that super clock there. You need that yeah, super clock definitely, there. Definitely, Sometimes definitely. you'll find that your base itself is cancellous bone, and if it's cancellous yeah. bone that you've debrided, you can expect a super clot. But if it's yeah. your calcified layer and you're not going to get a super clot, I think at least making one or two puncture holes, which will get that uh, super clot in, would be important. Yeah. So probably to answer Abhay's question, yeah. uh, as we know, this very rightly said, debridement will actually remove the mechanical obstruction part. mechanical disturbance part and it will not do anything more but if you do micro fracture there will be additional regenerative process now we need to have some study which says that if you only do debridement how much how much many years that joint last and if you add some regenerative process how many years that joint last which is very difficult to do but i can quote one study by akizuki who published an article in kestar 1998 or 1999 what he did was he did hto in all the cases and in half the cases he just did the debridement and in other half the other half of the cases he did micro fracture and then he did follow up arthroscopy at one year 
so in the debridement case there was no cartilage regeneration or there were islands of cartilage regeneration and in micro fracture there were more thick and more stable cartilage regeneration so that is the difference he could make out between the debridement and micro fracture group now we cannot prove or disprove only debridement is going to make him patient happy or micro fracture will make them happy for a more, more longer duration of uh, follow up that is something which we need more studies on that yeah. Excellent, excellent discussion. Okay, so we'll get on to case five now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's case five. So this is a 32-year-old male. He comes to me in the clinic with pain and clicking in his knee since the last four months. Yeah. So you can see that that's a lateral femoral condyle area there, and measuring it, it's you can see that's the small area there. Yeah. And there. So, very quickly to our uh, faculty, how would you do this procedure? How would you treat this patient? Uh, would you fix the OCD fragment for these small lesions? Would you do an arthroscopic loose body removal with a BMS, mosaic plasty, ACI, or none of the above? Do you have MRI picture or something? So, he's come to me in the clinic. He's got is 32 year old male, pain, clicking in the knee since four months, and he already had this uh, scan with him, which he is showing me. So, how would you proceed with this? Okay, what's the outcome, Sandeep? Fixation of the OCD fragment, arthroscopic loose body. Okay, so really speaking, this is a trick question. And I think probably Deepak, uh, okay, so we'll close that. Deepak uh, uh, probably was catching on to it. So he's come to me with a CT scan and uh, he's actually referred for a mosaic plasty. But don't go based on a CT scan ever. Always ask for an MRI. You know? Yeah. So you want to always go ahead with an MRI because when you do the MRI, you might find that it's really not an OCD, but it's a chondrocalcinosis, which of course doesn't require uh, any surgery at all. You can see that that's the same patient. That's the chondrocalcinosis out there. That's the chondrocalcinosis out there. That's what it looks like on MRI, no cartilage lesion there. And that's what it looks like on CT. So on CT, it could be it could fool all of us into thinking that this is an OCD. It's actually it's not an OCD, it's a chondrocalcinosis. So I think uh, none of the above. Always uh, get an MRI done. If you're thinking of any cartilage procedure, get an MRI done. Uh, I apologize to the faculty. This was a trick uh, sort of question. And I, I asked you. Really, 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 really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, just, just, uh, just something for fun. But remember, for everyone who's seeing this, always get an MRI done. Or you think of uh, offering so, your patient anything. So what did you do for that patient? For the uh, nothing. I, so basically, uh, he had a crystal disorder and was treated by a rheumatologist. No surgery at all. Just medical line of treatment. Uh, Dinsha, just the x-ray was showing anything? That's the question which has come up. Uh, he didn't have his x-ray with him. He was referred for a mosaic plasty with the CT scan. And when I examined him, you know, he had, of course, pain and he had this click, click sensation. So I said, can you, do you have the same sensation in the up, uh, other knee too? He said, yeah, I have this in the other knee and I have it in lots of my joints. And I said, of course, maybe it is something, but we will, of course, get an MRI done. You want to see what it is. And that's when exactly there, uh, you know, this is a classical chondrocalcinosis. Uh, before we go to the next uh, case, uh, there's a question yeah. of micro fracture. So yes. which is better, micro fracture, nano fracture, micro drilling? or uh, uh, something like an arthrex procedure where they have got a control pick? Okay, so I think basically my opinion is that when you're doing a bone marrow stimulation, you <laughs> want to preserve the subchondral bone. Your subchondral bone is your base and your subchondral bone is what the cartilage will grow on. What is the purpose of that hole? The purpose of the hole is only to get your pluripotent mesenchymal cells from the marrow to come there and form the superclot. So what do I do? I take one single hole right in the center of the lesion, which goes deep enough into the marrow and wait and see, is this a large enough superclot coming there? Rarely, I will also take a second one 
for a large you know thing like you saw for the patella uh, so i like to make the least possible puncture holes in the subchondral plate something that dipak mentioned very important remember micro fractures very good for grade 4 chondral lesions but not good for osteochondral lesions so osteochondral lesions again it's not a great option so for me a single puncture hole now whether you do that with a k wire whether you do that with a nano device whether you do that with a drill drilling you don't want to create heat because heat will create uh, thermal necrosis if you're doing it with a drill keep it on oscillatory mode so it goes in and creates that hole i think whatever you do to make sure that you've got a super clot that's all that's required if you're comfortable with a small micro fracture and you're getting a super clot i think that's good enough okay perfect <laughs> Okay, case six. So this is a 19-year-old male, and he's come with a persistent anterior knee pain. Yeah, he's had this pain for over a year and a half. That's what his MRI looks like. And for this year and a half, he's been just taking uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs every day. He says, as long as I can take this, I can sleep. if i don't take this medication i can't sleep so that's the mri and that's the ct scan so uh santosh what's your diagnosis osteoarthritis patella okay so i think there's no doubt about that this is a classical osteoid osteoma sitting there in the subchondral region just under the articular cartilage so that's the articular cartilage that's the articular cartilage there the articular cartilage is not broken but it's sitting there in the subchondral region osteoid osteoma how are you going to treat this patient so are you going to offer him non operative approach just continue with nsaids and physiotherapy are you going to do a ct guided radio frequency ablation is it going to be an arthroscopic excision with rf or an arthroscopic evaluation an open excision of this with grafting osteochondral grafting or are you going to try and do an open excision through the patellar bone so through the patellar bone means will you try and come from the uh, from this area and take it out instead of take it out from this area okay so these are your options okay let's see the result yes and the result <coughs> okay so i'll tell you what my thing was so this is a very interesting result so i thought exactly like everyone who said about the ct guided one so i sent him to, to our interventional radiologist and requested that can we please get a ct guided thing done because that would be the best approach and he said look we normally would not like to do this because the articular cartilage is just there and when we put our probe in if the probe needs to go into this and we can be sure that your articular cartilage is going to be destroyed so they refused to do a ct guided radio frequency ablation and therefore i had to do what 30% had already said that they would do an arthroscopic evaluation and open marginal excision with uh, osteochondral grafting and as you can imagine the difficult part in this is trying to know exactly where the osteoid osteoma is because the cartilage was totally intact and you know that it's in the subchondral region so we had to actually from the ct scan make a map and a grid and that map with the grid we took to intra op put that grid on top and then identified it the x ray of course uh, fluoroscopy was of no use because the x ray didn't show the lesion and then exactly where we had marked out in that grid we took our uh, 6.5 uh, mosaic plasty and made a core and then in that core took it out confirmed that we had the whole osteoid osteoma in there we sent it subsequently of course for histopath and it was an osteoid osteoma and then that area that we took out the 6.5 we then did a single peg out there so that's the single peg that we took out and then that single peg was put in you can see out here how it's fit in and this is the 12 month follow up where that entire single peg of uh, mosaic has completely healed so that cartilage also healed really well and the subchondral bone also healed really well so 
uh, not really a cartilage lesion, but a subchondral lesion, which had to be treated in, uh, in quite an innovative uh, sort of uh, way. Uh, Dr. Narvikar, have you faced any of these in your extensive uh, experience? No, I have not. Uh, any of the other faculty members who have something to add to this uh, or any what other are the, What are these artifacts? That is uh, Vicryl, I guess. These uh, closure, vicryl. Yeah, so this was an open approach. Uh, th these are just the vicryl artifacts that we're seeing probably, you know, some part of- 12 months. Yeah, at 12 months. So sometimes we see, you know, you're going to see it for a long, long uh, period of time. So I, 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 see, I see such artifacts in ACI cases very frequently. I think it's just the closure. I think mm -hmm. it's the closure and we see this uh, even in, uh, you know, uh, so these kind of you know, artifacts are commonly seen. I don't, I, uh, these are not uh, uncommon. Okay, so we'll go to case seven. And uh, this is a 19 year question, old male. Richard, the question yes. was that uh, only excision could have helped, uh, no grafting, it is a small lesion. Mm, I would not like to leave uh, I know it's a shoulder defect. It's only 6.5 millimeters. I would not like to leave this to chance that will it fill up or will it not fill up? I think that's an option. But when you've opened it out and you've got everything in front of you, if you have used a mosaic plastic to make the peg you know, to take it out, then I think that I would rather put in a, a, a graft there. So I would put in a graft. I would not leave it alone. Okay. Would any of the other faculty members uh, leave it alone, saying that it's a 6.5 lesion, not so large, it's a well shouldered defect, the super clot's going to come and fill it up, and you don't really require to put in a peg? Okay, so I think the answer is no. I think everyone would do the same thing. Okay. So Vinod wants to just say something. Yeah, Vinod. Vinod, unmute yourself, please. Vinod is gone. We know this gone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I just... uh, yeah. No you're problem. There. Yeah. You can ask Dr. Vinod. Vinod, any? Uh, were you wanted to say something for this? Yeah. Actually, for this, I am okay. But I have similar experience of osteoid osteoma in a in a lateral condyle area, just articular. So okay. it was a difficult diagnosis, and the patient was presenting even a pain and means even sort of flexion deformity. And finally, after years, we uh, patient uh, came to us and then in a CT scan, we could diagnose this as a cause. And retrospectively, I find that luckily it was even evident, even an uh, X-ray, plain X-ray. So here I have to just uh, means uh, extra articular approach. I just decompressed and put some bone graft there without entering into the joint. joint. So uh, this is a means maybe one differential diagnosis uh, around knee. Uh, once uh, pain is uh, even on rest and doesn't go with the uh, nasids and all that. So Absolutely. that's what I want to share. In fact, that was uh, why I'd also put down as one of the options that would someone come in from, so you open it and you take out the full thing from here and take it out without touching the articular cartilage. I mean, um, I don't know whether someone would think of that, but I thought that because the cartilage is right there, ultimately that may not work and that, therefore I went in uh, from the joint itself. Dinsha, and, I agree uh, with you because you know, we are more experienced yeah. in doing mosaic plasty Correct. rather than going, coming integrate from top. So, Not knowing where the lesion is. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. You don't know where the lesion is. So we yeah, did yeah. all of these grids. We marked out exactly where it is, so many millimeters from this, from that, so that when we went in, we wouldn't have the scenario where we've taken it here and said, oops, it's not yeah. here. Now we take it here. Oops, it's not here. Now we take it here. That would have been a disaster. Yeah. No, no, there would be a fracture. Absolutely. Fracture. Exactly. Absolutely. That's why I think the important part is the planning. Get your uh, CT scan, get the grid made so that you know exactly where you need to go and target the lesion. Okay, so let's get to case seven. This is a 19-year-old male. He's had bilateral knee pain of one-year duration. He's had a history of oral corticosteroid intake for six weeks in the past for a chronic sinusitis that he had. He's got a normal alignment and he comes with this particular x-ray. On the x-ray, we can see that he has this large zone of uh, OCD or osteonecrosis. He's got some chronic sort of subchondral changes going on there in the x-ray. We get his MRI done 
In the MRI, you can see that there's this unstable fragment out here. All of the subcondyl bones eaten up. He's got some amount of bone marrow edema in this region. So what did we do? We waited for about four to five months, hoping that we wouldn't have to treat him. This was in an era before uh, ACI. And uh, at that point in time, these uh, synthetic osteochondral pegs had come in. This lesion was too large to think of doing a mosaic plasty. He would have lost a lot of his cartilage. So we did a four peg uh, synthetic biphasic uh, osteochondral grafting. We did it on both his knees. And surprisingly, one knee did very well. And this knee, over time, did not do well. So this knee, the pegs are there, looks good initially. But in about a year, year and a half, he comes back. And he says that I was OK for some amount of time, but now my pain has come back. And when we look at the x-ray, we can see that those pegs have completely got lysed over time. He's got this big area of defect. And all of these pegs are gone. So there's no real articular cartilage there. So we went back in. We can see that this is a failed uh, cartilage repair. And we had to take out all of these uh, you know, loose sort of fragments that were there. So he had no real good cartilage. The subcondyl bone was not good enough. And we are left with this big sort of a hollow in the medial femoral condyle. So large area of AVN. We cleaned it up as far as we could. And we were left with this. So my question to you now would be, uh, his alignment was OK. His alignment is OK. Would you leave this alone? Would you do a mosaic plasty for this lesion? Would you do an autologous chondrocyte implantation with a bone grafting? Would you do an allograft? Or would you do some other treatment? I didn't put the MRI in, but the MRI shows us that he's got geographic areas which are healing also on the lateral side and other sides. So he's got no other osteochondral lesion in the knee. So just for this area, how would you treat this area? So you can see it's a huge area. How would you treat this? Leave it alone, mosaic plus T, ACI. If you're doing ACI, I'm sure you have to do BG, uh, bone grafting with it, a osteochondral allograft, or some other treatment. His alignment is all right. OK, so let's get the results in. So 75% uh, osteochondral allograft and 25% uh, ACI with BG. I think both of these are uh, perfect sort of options. Uh, uh, ACI with BG, uh, easier option, a cheaper option. But if you've got uh, an allograft, then I think an allograft would be the best option because such a large amount of bone to be reconstructed. So we got an osteochondral allograft. And from the osteochondral allograft, we did a open mega oats, so a single one there. And we can see that that bone, this is at about a year later, that bone is healed. And you can see here, that this, this MRI actually is uh, about, I think, 18 months uh, or two years. You can see that that bone has healed up really well. And we did a second look arthroscopy. And you can see that the interface also has healed up well. So a good MOCAT score. And I think, as all of the faculty mentioned, in these very difficult scenarios, it's always going to be an osteochondral allograft because to reconstruct bone and cartilage in one shot Otherwise, it becomes extremely difficult. Dinsho, is Dinsho. there a possibility of uh, taking a graft from the posterior part of the condyle, uh, something called as a mega oats, and then transfer it there? Because that's eventually not going to be used too much in our day-to-day -day activity. Uh, I would not do that because you are going to require a graft size, which is going to be of this size. So unless your patient is not going to be flexing beyond 90, I think that would be OK. I think also the depth of the lesion. So if you see the depth of the lesion, the depth of the lesion is, uh, you know, you're going to have to get pegs or something that's at least about uh, 20 millimeters deep. And that's uh, going to be very critical. So my options really for this uh, were, if we look back here, 
if you're looking at a mosaic plasty, I was in fact thinking of taking the cartilage from the tibiofibular joint. So we know that you can do a mosaic plasty from the tibiofibular joint itself. So take the entire tibiofibular joint and take multiple pegs from there. And that would have been an autogenous mosaic plasty. That's the only thing that would have given you the sort of depth that you require. I think an autologous from the same knee would have been practically impossible. And since he already had uh, geographic areas in other parts, you know, I didn't want to uh, risk that. Uh, Dinshaw, if you were to do it with uh, ACI with VG, how are you going to do that bone graft? I mean, do you think you'll you, be able to do these pegs? Uh, no, I think you'll have, you'll have to take iliac crest. You'll have to take iliac crest and from the iliac crest make a big sort of uh, you know piece. Put that piece in. If you don't get a press fit, you might actually have to use a fixation. I think with these That's large right. pieces. No, no, and no fixation needed. No. And then do that because it otherwise will be quite difficult. And you can see. These are the geographic areas uh, which are there in the other part of the joints too. So, you know, that's the reason that you would probably not want to go in, in the same joint at least to take your graph. So, if you don't fix, you want to put it in, then you would wait for that six weeks and then come ahead and then do the ACI? No, 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 no. One stage, one stage. Because one stage, you would first go in and take out the uh, graphs. At that time, you would have taken out your cartilage. But uh, are you sure that whatever you pack in with the bone is going to remain there and not uh, displace? So because that's why this, yeah. this, this lesion seems to be fairly big and irregular, unlike Correct. the earlier one that you had shown. Correct. For a ACI, I thought probably osteochondral single bone graft was the ideal answer for this. But yeah. if you didn't have that, and as somebody has already said that, that they would probably do a bone graft, I was just wondering how you could keep that bone graft stable enough so that you could, you know, put the ACI on top of it. Or would you do it in two stages? Can I add to it? Yeah, go ahead, Deepak. So, Abhay, what yeah. I do is I take tricortical graft, yeah. remove all the periosteum. Correct. If you look into the defect, the walls of the defect are intact. The, yeah. All the walls of medial condyle, all are intact. So, yeah. I put the whole tricortical graft, slightly bigger than the defect size, and I bank the whole thing in, and it stays. Okay. I've done almost eight or nine cases so far, and none of them required any fixation. It stays there. Okay, and then you put your AC on top of it, so it's no, a single. No, stick. no. So what I do is when I take biopsy, I put iliac crest. Ah, that's what. Okay, and then then you know what has happened six weeks. Yes, so exactly six what weeks I put the uh, ACI on top of it. Ah. So that would be an open approach on the biopsy time also. Yes, as well. Both the times, yes. So okay. two arthrotomies. Yeah. Two arthrotomies, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that makes more sense. Dinsha, so, there is a question regarding viability of an uh, uh, allograft. So the cartilage cells, uh, how yeah. does they regenerate and are they valid? Absolutely. So now multiple studies with uh, second look arthroscopies and cartilage biopsies also have shown that this becomes highline cartilage. So you can see out here, in this post-op MRI with a MOCART of 95, this highline cartilage heals up really, really well. And here you can't even see the interface. As you saw in the ACI one where we could see the interface, there's no interface. So, you know, it integrates really, really well. So the bone graft also heals and the cartilage also heals and you get a good highline cartilage. And that's why a lot of people who have access to osteochondral allograft are opting for osteochondral allograft for a lot of their repairs, saying that, look, that's the best source of highline cartilage. You can get a lot of it. Uh, uh, incorporation is not too much of a problem. It's immune privilege, so you don't land up with an immune reaction in uh, patients. So that's why they uh, opt for that. So uh, healing is good, and it's good highline cartilage. And on top of it, if it is a fresh allograft, then chondrocytes remain viable. But wow. in this case, yeah. of course, it may not be a fresh allograft. Dinsha, just one more question. If in the same case, if it was uh, SLE or some other condition where the uh, cause remains to continue or the steroid intake is continued, uh, would the management differ? I think that in a young patient like this, you know, who's got these geographic <laughs> areas also, so you can see this area there, lateral side, I think any lesion has to be taken care of. Just leaving it alone, I think would not be a good uh, option for a patient like this. So if I know st uh, ongoing steroid treatment is pro uh, probably for me would be, uh, you know, I would, I would not like to do it with ongoing steroid treatment because there's no guarantee that you've done a good procedure here and now you don't land up with a problem in the lateral side subsequently, or this also fails uh, because of your steroid. 
but at the same time, I wouldn't like to just leave it alone. I would certainly like to reconstruct that area. And uh, is it called also Bayou Uni? Is this also called a Bayou Uni? Uh, not really. Yeah. The, in the bio unis, what they do is usually kissing lesions. So they would do not just the femoral condyle, but also something on the tibia. And uh, there have been some cases reported also a meniscal allograft being done along with an osteochondral allograft. So that's the true, you know, bio uni knee. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so what happens to a patient? So we saw that that was a medial femoral condyle uh, which had not collapsed. But this is a similar patient where the collapse has taken place. So he's a 21-year-old male medical student, bilateral knee pain for the last two years. He had history of uh, taking anti-tubicles treatment for pulmonary TB three years back. He doesn't remember any steroids being prescribed to him. So he said that, no, all I took was ATP, no steroids. And he's got a normal limb, limb alignment. In fact, he's uh, a little into uh, valgus, so that's good for us. And he has this picture, a medial femoral condyle, which is completely collapsed following uh, AVN. And he's got it bilaterally. So bilateral medial femoral condyle osteonecrosis with collapse, that's the X-ray, that's the MRI. Um, I'm not gonna have a poll question for this because I think all of us uh, know that this is a really difficult scenario but I just want to show the second indication for these allografts. So what we can do in this is open it. And once we open it, then you again take an osteochondral allograft, uh, reconstruct your osteochondral allograft there. As Dr. Narvika mentioned, this was at a time when we didn't even have the bio, so we had to use these uh, countersunk metallic pervert screws. And you can see that that's the patient on the right side. That's the post-op that we've done. So that's the allograft done the post-op. The left was still pre-op at that point of time. And then we did, so it was a stage procedure. You can see that this heals well. So the subchondral bone heals well. Those are of course the countersunk uh, screws. Uh, this patient, we were just ongoing because we were scared that if there's a collapse of the bone, those screws are gonna create a problem, but it didn't collapse, it healed well. It went on to heal well, and that's done well. So that's on the one side. But on the opposite side, again, we did the same procedure, but we couldn't get a graph that was matching so well. But we still had to use it, so we got a good restoration in SAG. But as you can see here, the sizing wasn't as good. So we didn't get a very large condyle on the medial side. We got a slightly smaller one, but still well healed and uh, did well. So... Just a, uh, clinically, again, he's done really well. He got his full range. So my question to the faculty at this stage was, you know, Dr. Narvekar, uh, any other points that we don't have allograft, anything that you can add, what can we do for these kind of patients? I really wouldn't know because uh, I have not really uh, treated these uh, patients. But I think allografts is the only way out. I mean, there is nothing that you can do in order to give that contour to this, uh, as I see it. Okay, I agree with that. I couldn't think of any other option. Deepak, what about you? If you had to face this patient and you don't have an access to osteochondral allograft, how would you treat him? Uh, I have just one case which I have treated which was similar to this one where I use iliac crest okay. and I shaped it. I got 3D CT scan done of the opposite knee because it was a one side problem. So on the opposite knee, we took the 3D CT scan and measured the, the, all the sizes the interposterior diameter, the side-to-side -side diameter, and then we cut the iliac crest in that shape. And we, I put the whole iliac crest, a rounded iliac crest, at the place of the condyle. And uh, we explained to the patient that on top of iliac crest, he will need uh, ACI after some time. But uh, he's now six years follow-up. He's a farmer. He comes back regularly and he says, I have no pain. So he's happy with just iliac crest. I feel that some fibrous tissue has formed over the iliac crest and he's just managing, but at one point of time, he will need some. Pro he will have some problem, and he will need some definitive procedure. But just one case where I put the iliac crest. So what did you do? You fix the iliac crest there, or yes, yes, yes. I fixed the iliac crest with, with screws, screws, with, with screws, screws like this. With screws, with screws. Yes, exactly. And no cartilage on top. No cartilage on it. I just oh, put wow. lots of. I put just lots of micro fractures 
hoping yeah. that some fibrocartilage will form and it will give me one or two year of time. And this is the time when ACI was banned in India for a few years. So I thought that uh, let the phase will be over. But yeah. now it's five years, almost five and a half years and patient says, I'm happy. Why you want to put cartilage on it? Okay. Okay, so this will be an interesting case of yours to see. This boy now has a 16 yeah. year follow up. You know, he's 16 years down the line and this uh, osteoconal allograft really has been a lifesaver for his uh, knees. Okay, so we go to then, case uh, I think, uh, Deepak, yeah. you should wonder whether our micro fractures and debridements really make a lot of difference in the long run because I don't think we still have the proper answer for a cartilage defect. We've been doing things, but we really don't know because I think whatever I did no, 20 I years ago, I am exactly doing the same thing today also. <laughs> <laughs> now I totally agree with you, Abhay, because the cartilage science is definitely not perfect. And at present, I'm doing a review for Indian Arthroscopy Society, and I have just concluded that 25 years down the line, there is no gold standard still. Exactly. Yeah. So I totally agree with you. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes left. And I'll get to case nine now. Okay. So case nine. Uh, here's a boy. We can see that he's got bilateral. So he's got bilateral lateral femoral condyle uh, lesions. And again, the same sort of uh, history. He had a history of taking antitubercular treatment three years back. Uh, he's got these geographic areas and all of these geographic areas we were conserving for a long period of time. And then he came in with the lateral femoral condyle of one knee collapsing out there. So we can see sequentially when we've got MRIs done, when he first came to us with this kind of a lesion, we had just uh, you know left it alone saying, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Slowly, it collapsed. That fragment became into a loose piece, and this is what it became. So he's got a large lateral femoral condyle area without cartilage. So what would you do for this patient? Would you leave it alone? Would you do a bone marrow stimulation? Would you do a mosaic plasty, HCI, allograft, or some other treatment? He's in three degrees of valgus. It's within the limit of normalcy. So there's no malalignment. So no malalignment issue out here. No injury, nothing. This is basically ACI, 43%, mosaic, allograft. And we'll see about the, some other treatment. So uh, the first knee that I did was at a time when ACI was not available. So that one knee, I in fact, did with an osteochondral allograft. And the second knee, which we, you know, we waited for a long time, actually happened in the era of ACI. So we said it would be much better to do an ACI for that lesion. So we opened it, put in the ACI. He got back his full range. And that was his uh, MRI at one year. So at one year, that's the whole lesion that's healed out there. Uh, that's the whole lesion that's healed out there. Uh, at two years, we could see that that had completely healed. And then by about two years or so, he was back to his running. Yeah, he was very keen uh, distance runner. And this was one, uh, this was amongst our first, I think, uh, five, six, uh, yeah, fourth. This was just our fourth, I think, ACI of the lateral femoral condyle. And uh, we did a second look arthroscopy for him. And uh, we can see that that was a really good second look arthroscopy. Uh, he was, in fact, part of our uh, prospective study when we had first started it off. So that's the cartilage surface that you get. Good interface integration at the periphery. So no sort of cleavage, no blisters, no hypertrophy. Very nice, firm, uh, white cartilage. I have done no biopsies. I have personally not done a single biopsy for any of these ACIs. Uh, have any of the faculty members done biopsies and confirmed that our ACIs also are high line? So I have done two cases, two yeah. cases of biopsy. Yes. And my, my wife is a histopathologist, so I had that some advantage of getting this thing done. 
Yes. And in both the cases, it was patchy area of high line okay. with in between uh, poor areas of high line cartilage. So okay. it was like that in a pattern, you can see that there are some areas with a good high line cartilage, but in between there will be, you know, break in the cartilage or some fibrous tissue in between. So now, I you put think it as... People, yeah. Now, do you think that that's a technique related issue or is that a general ACI related issue? And how can we get more high line cartilage in an ACI? I think, hole, yeah. I think uh, expecting our procedure to produce a pristine high line cartilage is over expectation because nature produces hyaline cartilage because it also produces lots of collagen and agrican and other glycosamines and that forms the you know pristine hyaline cartilage what we do is we just supply autologous, autologous chondrocytes and we expect them to replicate themselves and also produce lots of collagens and agricans and you know to form the pristine hyaline cartilage so that is too much of expectation from our chondrocytes and i don't think uh, at present our technology is robust enough to provide that type of uh, highland cartilage. There are some papers where they are characterizing chondrocytes, which is, uh, you know, tricked to produce more collagen or more agrican. So that can probably produce more highland cartilage or there are certain papers which uh, tricks chondrocytes to have more number of cells. And those more number of cells are likely to produce better highland cartilage. But these are just experimental studies at this stage. So I think we should not expect pristine highland cartilage from uh, ACI at this stage. Okay. Dr. Narvekar, your views on this, those puncture holes that we make in the subchondral bone <laughs> to give our ACI stability. Do you That's think right. that, you know, there's an issue with that uh, puncture holes should be smaller or anything like that? That's and exactly what, that's exactly what I was going to tell Deepak just now. That probably the, uh, you know, the fibrocartilage that forms is probably from the marrow that comes from there where we are making multiple small holes and that could be contributing. But without that, uh, I guess you would not have uh, any way by which you could hold that clot together. Just wondering whether there has been any uh, long-term study between the Macy, the one that uh, Verticells made, the Macy and our uh, the way we do our uh, ACI, you know where you are actually only not doing anything to the subchondral bone, just putting the uh, collagen along with the cells on it and stitching it on the raw area. Whether so, the high cartilage just... there in any way is different and better than the way we are doing <laughs> uh, Abhay, we what holes we put are not uh, to penetrate the subchondral bone fully. These holes are meant to just, uh, you know, go to the part of the subchondral bone, not full thickness. They are partial thickness subchondral bone. If yeah, there, while, is, there is uh, bleeding from those areas. No, no, there should not be any bleeding. That if is, you make holes, listen, if you yeah. make holes during fibrin ACI, yeah. that means you have done microfracture. Correct. Okay. If you have done microfracture and if you do ACI together, that means you are mixing two procedures. And okay. it's a proven fact that microfracture is a precursor for a failure to ACI. Correct. So if holes are deep enough, then we have not done a good job. Holes has to be very superficial and not penetrating the subchondral bone. Absolutely. So I agree with that completely. So that's what I want to show out here. That in our initial cases, based on you know our information, you know, 10, 12 years back was to, and that's why we were making holes that were relatively deep so that the graft could get a better sort of hold in these larger lesions. But I think that that's really not needed. You don't require to have deep holes going in. Uh, I think it, the more shallow the hole, the better. But at the same time, if you don't have a hole, uh, make a hole, I think your rotational and shear stability of the graft would be less. So you ideally want a scenario where with the, you know your puncture holes are very small, going through just that calcified layer, so that that graft gets a hold, but at the same time, it doesn't bleed. But often I don't get that. Often I will get some amount of bleeding, exactly what Dr. Narvikar mentioned. So I think that may be one of the causes why uh, ACI ends up with a mixture. It's never a high line. Uh, it's always a mixture of high line and fibro. Yeah, Dr. Dinsa. Yes, we know. Yeah, uh, I, uh, you see, this is very important that these chondrocytes and blood, they are opposite. Blood is toxic for chondrocytes. This has to be understood by each and everyone that in presence of blood, chondrocyte does not survive. So that is very important that we should never penetrate and it should be as without blood as possible if you are putting cells. 
secondly uh, what i feel that uh, what uh, dr deepak has told probably techniques are not 100% mimicking the natural biology but this is a ray of hope that if a high line cartilage even in patches is there then probably with time the remodeling process will keep on and what patches you are seeing at two years probably may convert into broader area as time passes and other insults are not happening so probably the time also is a factor that by this process the recovery is not so fast or especially about the specialized cartilage if we want highlight so with time as passes probably the amount of highline cartilage may be more and more so it's definitely a promising result but time required may be more than what we may expect agree i agree with vinod uh, absolutely so deepak how many of your micro fractures have you revised in how many years because of uh, recurrent pain uh abhay i started doing micro fractures somewhere in 2004 and till 2010 11 i was very happy because none of them came back and i thought see all the reports say that uh, this micro fracture fail but my cases are not failing but 6 7 years down the line there yeah. were patients who came back who started complaining of pain or some catching sensation some of the patients i did rearthroscopy and i just found overgrowth of cartilage and i shaved it off and the patients were okay but in two patients i found that the cartilage thickness was eroded you know there were areas of exposed bone and those cases i converted into mosaic plastic so right. i cannot say that all cases fail because now it is 16 years i am doing micro fracture and i can very well say that roughly 60% patients has not come back to me at least and uh, they have probably well healed but 30 40% of the patients beyond 5 to 6 years definitely started complaining of pain most of them responded to counseling or some physiotherapy and few required a rearthroscopy okay then so the can... other day yeah we had a webinar where brian cole told that there is a technique now to just take a bit of cartilage from the intercondylar notch and then mix it with bmac like a paste and then just apply it back and uh, it is a hope uh, hopeful situation where you can't afford an aci or stuff like that so what is the take of the faculty on that yeah so i have in fact done uh, i think about one or two of these these are available in india also now so what it is is it's autologous particulate cartilage that you're putting in so what do you do you take a few flakes of cartilage with your shaver and uh, uh, these flakes of cartilage basically are autogenous they are high line and then these are fragments that you put into either a bmac or a fibrin clot and then it gets stuck out there to be quite honest uh, literature supporting this right now is not there it's too new a procedure but i think it's a great one step sort of procedure it's simple um it certainly is something over and above a micro fracture is it going to be as good as an aci is it going to be as good as a mosaic plasty i don't know i i i don't think anyone knows that because no studies have been done on it it's too new deepak any comment so so there is one study by christiansen in 2016 who performed some study on mini peak and uh, there was just 12 month follow up on those mini peaks there was study by kevin stone in 2017 where he had a follow up almost 17 years but his success rate was only 40% and there was another study by wang in 2018 where the follow up is only 3 years and he says promising results and good mri signals but again no long term results or no clinical data so as dinshaw said very preliminary result is available with us and uh, it's only time will tell whether these procedures are good enough or not and then sir one study I, from that far uh, on allogenic minced cartilage yes uh, yes he also had a promising result but that study was given up by the company so that was, that was <laughs> not published but the results was uh, promising according to him also you see i may i say one word yes please vidod yeah you see uh, the result seems to be good at least preliminary but i have one uh, basic uh, biological objection which uh, is there you see if you take the scratches of mature highline cartilage then what is the cells are already mature and number of blast cells are very less so we cannot expect from a mature cell to replicate and form as good as from the Uh, pro, uh, means these blast cells. 
so that is uh, a theoretical thing which probably uh, doesn't match with the uh, means better result in comparison of uh, the proper uh, these uh, chondrocytes which are created in enough number uh, by culture method so that i feel probably we may not get that good results as we are getting in a proper cultured cells in a in a proper number that uh, we also very very, very good yeah cells. very good observation there so actually this procedure when they first started it was with embryonic cartilage and yeah. when they sort of saw good results with that but not everyone's going to have embryonic particulate cartilage with them so then they felt could we also do it with autogenous of course ah, yeah. exactly what you're saying is so valid that we always try and take a step further to make it easier for us surgeons when we don't have these things but ultimately are the results there and are they validated results i think that's so important yeah it's a question good point with good point good. see the thing is uh, uh, deepak yes i can doctor arvita you want to finish that case we can discuss later okay so this is the last case this is the last case uh, since we are almost we are on time oh no we are exactly 8 o'clock so we, this yeah. will be a quick last case so this is a 53 year old male so again a similar scenario which i want to show 53 year old male he's got a medial femoral condyle lesion i think all of us know that that's spunk so spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee he's got a varus he's got a medial collapse lateral compartment is perfectly all right that's his scanogram there we can see that his mpta is about 84 he's got a varus of about 7 degrees on the mri he's got this huge medial lesion here and he's got this picture on the mri his meniscus is all right no root tear what would you do so your last poll question 53 year old male would you go ahead with just medical treatment and a medial offloader knee brace would you do a uh, bone marrow stimulation with hto mosaic plasty with hto aci with bg with hto would you do an osteochondral allograft with hto or would you say look he's 53 i'm just going to do a uni knee or maybe continue just now and then do a total knee later Okay, let's see the result. Forty-four percent for a UKA or a TKA uh, mosaic plasty with HTO, BMS uh, with HTO. Okay, so I'm going to quickly show you what I did. Uh, I did an ACI with BG with HTO. This was when the you know ACI had just come in. I thought fifty-three. That's the lesion size, and uh, i knew that my hto had to be my most important thing so i did this in two stages when i took out this large area i did the hto at that uh, time itself so that was the hto i then went ahead in that second stage when we got the graft and took ilia crest and very similar to what i showed with that previous patient i put in multiple ilia crest and uh, reconstructed the bone area and then put the aci on top of that and then allowed it to heal and uh, this patient now this is his 10 year follow up so his knee has survived for the last 10 years he's 63 now no pain alignment good that lesion has almost filled up i think primarily because of the bone graft he's got osteophytes now coming on the lateral side too but in his standing x ray again he still has joint space on the lateral side and he's quite happy with this procedure so uh, uh, and with a 10 year follow up now so deepak what's your opinion on what was your opinion primarily and what would you do for this patient so primarily looking on mri i thought that three plugs of uh, mosaic plasty will do and if three plugs of mosaic plasty will do of course sto is the first first surgery that everybody will do Okay. And uh, what what about the cartilage? So considering it as a bony plus cartilage lesion, and considering fifty three years old age with some degeneration, if three or four plugs of mosaic plasty will do, I will go for that. But since you have shown the arthroscopy picture, it is quite large. 
and uh, i think mosaic plasty will be too much for it will be too much for the mosaic plasty procedure so what okay. you did was perfectly all right uh, bone graft with aci is the good choice okay vinod question for you we've got a good result is it the hto that's given us the good result or do you think it's the cartilage uh, repair that we've done which has given us the good result you see hto definitely cartilage okay. plus minus okay exactly. so so you feel that even if we had done just the hto and left this lesion alone we probably might have got the same result uh, at least for short term okay means initial few years probably results may be almost same but actual difference may be there in long term means the survival of this knee may vary uh, depending on the success of cartilage procedure but initial early results i don't think will vary uh, too much din sir uh, yes even even in the spong you seen when the taking take, taking off the graft is also very difficult issue what's your opinion because this spong is totally 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 different sort of lesion rather than this all this osteochondral things this is completely exactly different exactly yeah. exactly so i think uh, that's the trick out there that when you're doing it for a spong you want to make sure that you're going deep into bone you've got nice healthy bleeding bone so that your bone to bone healing will uh, will take place i think that's uh, 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 critical i think what's also important to note is that if you if you have i really don't know if you do just the hto and leave this alone would that give you the same result i i uh, you know, i really don't know santosh what's your what's your view point on this um uh, santosh unmute yourself again yeah at this age a cellular procedure might not have given the result maybe bone grafting and hto is the reason for a good success probably a cellular good procedure point. with the 50 plus uh, reservations on that good point good. really really why would you say that do you think that all of us who are post 50 <laughs> don't deserve a, a cellular procedure in aci i mean if i had to come to you you wouldn't do an aci for me uh current evidence says that uh, the results of uh, 45 plus is not as good as less than 45 what is your view on this dr narvekar no i think uh, there is no i mean whatever you have done is uh, absolutely ideal and this is what should have been done uh, obviously the lesion was too big to uh, just do a microfracture or uh, a mosaic so you would have to go ahead and do something for the cartilage besides doing the high tibial osteotomy so i would do both Okay, and I don't think age is the bar. As yeah, no. My question was regarding that for ACI. No, uh, is do you think that uh, if you've got say a fifty-five-year-old patient and you take a cartilage biopsy, uh, have you had any patients where your cartilage has not grown? Because we've done quite a few over the age of fifty, and we've never had that in a, a problem. Okay. That the Absolutely, fully agree with you. Have you had any patients where your Deepak, cartilage has not Deepak, grown? Deepak, Deepak. Deepak is not listening. The question to Dinso. Dinso, can you put this just what Deepak was suggesting for the big lesions like putting the iliac crest graft and fix it? Deepak, sorry, I I didn't I missed something. There was something. Yeah. For the for the bigger lesion, probably sometimes we are thinking of putting the iliac crest graft and reshaping and pulling put putting some. Yeah, but fifty three fifty three is fifty three is little higher age for that, hmm. and uh, as I said earlier. i would like to go for a mosaic class if it is small if it is big yes bone graft has played a major role and i agree with uh, vinod and santosh both osteotomy has played a short term role long term result uh, is provided by bone graft and cells definitely have played some role but uh, only a rearthroscopy can tell us how much role cells have played and i completely agree with dinso please as because we are 50 don't don't desert and santosh us <laughs> you are below 50 that doesn't mean you are every time you refer that we are plus 50 okay but i would say that the hto is not just a short term goal i think the hto is the short term and the long term Both, 10 yes. years down if this knee is surviving i think of course our cartilage procedure has helped i i believe so but i think that without an hto certainly nothing yeah. would have but but uh, dinsho can you go back on the picture if you have okay now if you, no no one more yeah if you can see that surrounding cartilage is also degenerative in this of case course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right so of that course. was one of the reason why i am agreeing with santosh that even if the cells have played some role not much the, looking at the picture of uh, surrounding cartilage 
Dinsho, there is a question. Could you yes. do a primarily when you were taking uh, the uh, the graft for the cell culture? You can do bone grafting, and then when you get the culture back, you can again uh, open it up and then have a look, and then uh, sometime maybe graft has not taken up. True. So I'll tell you my, you know, these are uh, patients that we did when ACI had just come in. You know, these are all cases of 2008, 2009, at that time, and. At that point of time, we didn't really know. These were the questions that we were asking ourselves. You know, it's a 53-year-old male. We're going to do a biopsy. Will this cartilage grow or not in the first case? So that's when the first instance itself, when I went down to take out that loose piece, I did the HTO and did the cartilage biopsy. That if the biopsy comes positive, yes, we will address this uh, lesion. If the biopsy doesn't grow cartilage. I'm not going to be able to do anything. So this was the area that's gone. I knew I could not do a mosaic. It's too large for a mosaic. I know that I can't. You know, he's 53. Osteochondral allograft was an option, but at 53, you don't want to spend so much money. You might as well do a uni knee then at 53. So that's why I felt that we'll do the biopsy. If the cartilage grows, then yes, second stage I'm going to come in, bone graft it, and put the cartilage on top. And over the last 10 years now, we've got quite a few patients that we've done post 50, where I don't. I can't remember a single post sixty. I don't think I've done a ACI on anyone over the age of sixty. But fifty to sixty, we've got a lot of these cartilage biopsies which have all grown chondrocytes. So that means that the chondrocytes still have the potential to grow even after fifty. Uh, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it because of age. Dinsha, it's not the question of growth only. It's also the question of whether they get accepted at the host uh, host uh, site. And uh, what are the potential of those chondrocytes, which have of course yes, grown, yes, expanded, quality. but whether they have the capacity to re-differentiate themselves again to chondrocytes and produce right. the collagen and agrican materials? So True. that is questionable after 50, I think. Yes. True. Quality, quality is a big problem after 50. Yes. That's we have to ac accept 50. Up 50 plus is a problem, then so. <laughs> 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 okay, so so white white beard last, is a problem. To my <laughs> last slide. So basically, as we've seen in this uh, entire webinar, we've gone through all the different case scenarios, the algorithm for a knee chondral or osteochondral defect. So if you've got a traumatic osteochondral fracture, then I think an open or an arthroscopic reduction and fixation is a perfectly valid option. If you've got a partial thickness lesion. Then maybe just a chondroplasty would be good enough. But if you've got a full thickness lesion, then you have to see what are the techniques that are available to you in your armamentarium. For me, a very small lesion, less than five millimeters, I would normally just go for a bone marrow stimulation. If it's between five to twenty millimeters, I go for a mosaic plasty or an oats. Any lesion more than twenty millimeters in its diameter, I usually choose an ACI. If it's more than five centimeters, or if it's got a sectoral defect, that means it's a three-dimensional sort of defect. I think the only way to get the three-dimensional sort of congruity is with an osteochondral allograft. And for the bipolar lesions, which are basically degenerative in nature, I tend not to be too aggressive. I go just for a bone marrow stimulation. And in all of this, we shouldn't forget that you must correct the predisposing factors of alignment and stability. If alignment and stability are not there, Then we can't expect our cartilage repair to work. So, with that, I would like to thank uh, all of you for your inputs. And uh, over to you, IPS, uh, for any further last-minute questions or any further interaction yeah. between the faculty. Yeah, two two questions are there, Dinsha. Sure. Number one is how do you procure these allografts, and how do you size the allografts? So, mega allografts which you did, how do you size it? And how do you preserve it and procure it? Okay, so uh, basically, in osteochondral allografts or in any allografts, you've got uh, different types. So you've got the fresh frozen allografts, you've got the fresh osteochondral allografts. So we procure it nowadays from uh, Musculoskeletal Transplant Foundation. I think the sizing is the critical thing. So sizing-wise. You've got two options for this. You can either do a mega oats. So in a mega oats is exactly like an oats, but instead of you, uh, your largest oats would be a 10 millimeter. With the mega oats, you could go to a 20. You could go to a 25 also. So you've got one large cylinder, and that makes a much simpler sort of technique. You've got the Arthrex instrumentation for this. 
you take a single sort of thing, so it's easier. But that is only possible for the well-contained medial femoral condyle or lateral femoral condyle lesion. So you saw that revision case, I think, which is well-contained, you can do that. As soon as it's a sectoral defect in the trochlear region or the posterior part of the condyle, then you have to actually take multiple measurements, then uh, create, you know, like carpentry. So exactly what Deepak was mentioning, like carpentry, create that whole part from that bone, size it, get the full uh, restoration, then take your cut with a saw, put it into place, and then fix it with screws. So there's a lot of artistry involved in that, and I think that's the most difficult part of uh, allograms. Can you do yeah. 3D printing, Dinsha? Sorry? Have you tried 3D printing? No, we've not done any 3D printing for these. We've not done any uh, patient-specific. Uh, I know that you can get some PSIs abroad now for this, for osteochondral allografts. You can get patient-specific cutting jigs too, where you've done the whole thing as a 3D printed and then you do it, but we haven't done any of these with 3D printing or PSI. Uh, great, uh, Dinsha. I think uh, it was indeed a wonderful presentation and uh, your collection of cases are amazing. And I think uh, the involvement of all the panel, uh, thanks to all the panel, Dr. Abhay, Dr. Deepak, uh, Dr. Vinod, and uh, definitely uh, Santosh. Uh, it has made the program really very, very interactive and a lot of questions were asked and a lot of debates uh, happened. Uh, San uh, Samantha, if you can just conclude the webinar and then we can call yeah, it a day. Yeah, as usual, if uh, Dinsa is conducting any meeting and webinar that has to be the standard you don't have to tell because the insert is too good for that and the faculty we got like Deepak, Santos, Vinod and uh, uh, our Narbekar sir obviously we have got lot many things we have learned even I uh, take that Pratik was there, Deepak sir was also there and whole T EC members those, those who have attended really we are grateful because uh, we are all been every day we are doing something from the IS platform to have some academic discussion during this lockdown period. So I am really grateful to all the faculties and the EC member. Thank you all. And thank thank you. you, friends. We have uh, tomorrow a very big uh, name uh, coming for a webinar, Dr. Pascal. Uh, Samantha has been following him for a long time and has been able to get him into an IS platform. So tomorrow at 8 p.m. on 9th of May, we have Dr. Pascal below who's going to talk a master class on the arthro lethargy. So this is a must attend uh, session. And uh, hopefully everybody will take an advantage of Pascal being there. Uh, thank, wow. you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Thank you. Thank you, 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 Thank you,